Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to Society of Magical Can't Say That Word on YouTube. Uh, actually, I think we're actually allowed to say the title. Um, I've, I've yet to see anyone get in trouble for saying the title, so I guess this is the, um, the kind of yeah, PC variant of the N-word. Do you want me to say it? Dev. <laughs> I'll say it if you want, I don't mind. Dev. Didn't we learn this lesson with Sargon years and years ago, where he said it on somebody else's channel and this is and his Patreon got taken down? <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I'm actually a person of color, so it's fine. I can say it. I don't know if Italians count. They certainly do count. I'm buying We're time for at it. least the first 15 seconds to pass. That way the YouTube senses will, won't be as... Actually, I think this video was demonetized before it even started because I pointed out in the title that games genres would rather become whores than write about games, which is actually demonstrably provable, chat. That is not a spurious allegations. I have evidence. <laughs> yep, I've seen that too. Oh man, speaking of demonetization, I... Uh... My video yesterday actually got flagged, and it was a manual flag because it it was fine for a while, and then it got hit with the eight like the eight, the eighteen plus restriction. Then I had it. I, I did the review process, and after like an hour, it got the flag removed. So that's the sign of a bunch of people reported my video, and then YouTube looked at it and is like, "This is just a an automated. This is just an automated flagging. It's actually fine." And then put it back. So it's like, oh, oh someone didn't like what I said yesterday. Well, somebody didn't like a lot of things that were said the few uh, last days. Somebody did not like at all what Kobe Libby, which is a name in and of itself, uh, had to say with the Society of Magical Negroes. Uh, because you haven't watched this movie, have you? No, but I did see the trailers. You know, I it was it was being heavily pushed like last fall, last winter. It I was. was going to movies then. Yeah, I saw the trailers for sure. I haven't seen it either. It it, do, it doesn't even air in Norwegian cinemas. I was actually looking forward to this. I tried to find a, <laughs> a Russian connection, shall we say, to find an alternative way of seeing it. Nothing. People aren't even bothering pirating this thing. It's got to be one of the largest movie failures in... I, I don't even know. Like, Jesus, this this is making the Disney flops look positively successful. So what is this movie about, anyway? Uh, well, the movie is about the trope of the magical Negro, which I didn't even know was a thing, honestly. Uh, where oh, apparently, really? Yeah, no, where apparently in, in, in movies uh, there'll be so a black friend sense. who, like, helps the white guy out and make sure that his life is, like, comfortable or something, uh, and that he gets the girl in the end, apparently. It's it's a bit more complicated than that. It's the idea that, that, that the black person is never the hero. He's always the mentor. So a great... Um, I mean, this, this trope's kind of fallen out of fashion because, of course, it has. But, you know, a, a, a really good, more recent example would be in um in the Dark Knight trilogy of movies. Where was it Lucius Fox? Uh, Morgan, Morgan Freeman? Freeman, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a perfectly fine character. He's he's moral, he's upstanding, he's a good guy. But his role in the movie is Paris, to be older and to be wiser and to answer. teach Batman <laughs> and to help Batman, right? And that's that's what he does in those movies. He is a magical Negro character. Okay. I mean, I, I feel as I, I can kind of see where they're coming from with that, but at the same time, I, I would also point to movies like The Green Mile uh, coming out in the SD years to that. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that characterization, like that, that this was the, like that frequent of a trope because I never noticed even. But maybe that's my my white privilege speaking. Uh, maybe. Maybe here, you know, I, I'm gonna. I pulled it up on Wikipedia. I just want to see what what movies, because I know that it's it's less of a um, less of a novel thing and more of a movie thing as a trope for sure. A Green so, Mile is amazing, by the way, chat. Watch it. Yeah, it's a pretty good movie. Okay, let's see here. The Magical Negro is a trope in American cinema, television, and literature. The Magical Negro is a supporting stock character who comes to the aid of white protagonists in a film. Magical Negro characters often possess special insight or mystical powers, and they've long been a tradition in American fiction. 
The old-fashioned word Negro is used to imply that a magical black character who devotes himself to selflessly helping whites is a throwback to racist stereotypes. Yeah, so it's the... Like, there's... There's several very racist stereotypes in American literature and film, right? Like one of them is, you know, the very, the very savage, very criminal oriented black person who's just terrible to everyone around him. Um, the polar opposite of that is the magical Negro where he's, he's wise and he's helping and he's moral and he's good hearted, but he's ultimately harmless, right? And he only exists to make other people's lives easier. I mean, I'm, I'm looking up the, the Wikipedia page as well, and they actually list the Green Mile as an example of the magical Negro, which... See, okay, like, I always thought that he was the main character of that fucking movie, if I'm to be honest. <laughs> uh, what, was, what was his name? Um, uh, John Coffey? John Coffey, was that it? That sounds familiar. Let me Let's see. see. Yeah, John Coffey, yeah. No, I always yeah. thought he was the main character, because, like, the entire thing revolves around him. Like, he is the main character. He is, he is the plot point. He is, he is the fucking story. Well, yeah, but, I mean, the protagonist is clearly Tom Hanks' character, though. Yes. The story follows him. It's just that John Coffey is... He, he's the mysterious element. I suppose. I always viewed Tom Hanks' role in that movie as more like the camera, uh, if that makes sense. You know, as the point of the view. The narrator, maybe? Yeah, yeah kind of. Oh, Anna Talope just gave a super chat. He says, Shawshank Redemption is better than Green Mile. So, so here's the thing. I think the character in in Shawshank Redemption, it's actually inverted. Because the black character is helped by the white guy in the end. But they have the same kind of relationship. And... I, I disagree too. Like uh, the Shawshank Redemption, it's not a bad movie. I'm not saying that, but Green Mile's better. <laughs> the Green Mile is better. Green Mile's better. Yeah, the Green Mile's better. Uh, there's no doubt. And honestly, the Shawshank Redemption, I see, I see that maybe as more of an example of the magical Negro, because at least there he has like the, the guiding role where he's like, "Hey there, this is how prison works, no boy," and then he teaches him stuff. And then eventually, of course, the accountant gives him, like, a bunch of money. And it's like, hey, thank you. Here, here you go. Mm -hmm. So the, the magical Negro as a trope is pretty much the black person equivalent of the manic pixie dream girl trope. Where you have a very energetic alt girl who comes into the main character's life and simply serves to make his life better. Right? Can, you know, pick, pick him up and he's all fucked up and she helps him recover. And you know, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's that sort of thing. Um, the, the issue that I have with these tropes is, even though there's probably some validity to them, um, if you go back a little bit further and you look at the white people who did these tropes, you know, if you have, let's say, um, a white gangster instead of a black gangster. Service or you have um, a white you know, older mentor figure instead of a black one. It's not racialized. It's just a normal character. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, my impression of this is, so what you're telling me is uh, it's a supporting character, but we look at their skin color and all gender. Because that's, yes. all, that's all it is. It's a supporting character. But again, in the current year, we have to look at all of this and go like, well, black or woman. It's like, ah... Uh, this is the issue with entertainment, because I guarantee you, nobody who wrote The Green Mile or The Shawshank Redemption was like, yeah, he needs to be black because that will make him magical or something. It, it's one of those things where, it's, you know, I I get the point of, the tr of, of pointing out this trope back in the day, because let's say that you existed in a film environment where the only positive black characters were supporting characters. And they weren't actually heroes themselves. I, I could see after you see 10 or 20 or 30 movies of just that, you get a little bit fed up with it and be like, hold on, why can't there be a black hero? Well, we've been past that point now for like 50 years. Yeah, and I mean... There's I, been a I, lot of black heroes. <laughs> and at the same time, I mean, I guess, but then I'm going to immediately, like the parrot I am, say Blade as well. Or <laughs> Yep, exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I never... This was never really an issue, in my opinion. Uh, like, well, no, it was, to an extent. Like, um, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was probably, like, one of the one the first ones where the black character took, like, center stage, etc. Mm. Uh, but, like, 
that was an almost entirely organic evolution as well. It seems the more we've attempted to force this, the worse it has actually gotten. Yep, yep. It's one of those things where, like, this was probably a problem in the 60s, in the 50s, maybe. Yeah, and now, but, like... like... 50 60 years later we're 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 talking about this and it's so fucking out of date yeah yeah so since we know what the magical negro is the american society of magical negroes is a comedy film about a young black man who joins a group of magical african americans committed to enhancing the lives of white individuals so, like, that could actually be kind of funny if you do it right, you know? I can, yeah, no. I can see the humor in that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like, I was actually looking forward to this, so hoping that this... I uh, Naively, I was hoping this might be a return to the racial humor of the late 90s, early 2000s, where the joke would be, hey, look at white people in, in the wild, like like a Harris nature observer question. almost, Fire right? right? The answer. <laughs> and then slowly but surely, the main character would realize that, okay, this isn't actually how the world needs to be. Like, we should integrate together. And the joke is on both parts. The white people for being observed as the zoological animals. The you know, the classic trope Fire of why do white answer. people run towards the lion shouting, kitty! <laughs> And the black people would then realize that, okay, no, we aren't actually so different. We shouldn't view them as these weird alien creatures. We're actually both people. That was what I was hoping. And it's apparently not what happened, however. Yeah, so I don't I don't know what happened in this movie at all. I mean, I, I didn't see it, did you? Uh, nope. I, I've tried. I've tried really fucking hard. <laughs> but I, I can't. It's no... It's, uh, so to... Well, you um, know what? Maybe, maybe I'll go see it then. Maybe I'll go see it. I am I'm going to as soon as I can get a hold of a way to actually watch it I intend to uh, but the the movie director describes it that it was intended to make white people feel uncomfortable and all of that so I'm I'm suspecting they've got a very different view it sounds like my optimistic interpretation was wrong and this was simply just a race bait movie and if it was then the race bait has absolutely majestically failed I put a link in the link channel at the end there uh, the box office of the American Society of Magical Negroes has not broken two million dollars. It is at one point eight million oh, right now. That that's rough. That okay. is uh, bad. <laughs> I wonder what it costs to make. To put this into some fucking perspective, chat. Okay, Madame Webb grossed almost a hundred <laughs> million. All right. It, this isn't a flop. Like, this isn't a bomb. I don't know what to describe this as. Like, I don't know, a, just a hole in the earth or something? Because uh, they had some pretty big names in it. I, I pretty much guarantee you that the appearance fees alone ran them more than two million. Hold on a second. Na Naomi brought me some iced tea. I gotta open it up open it it wasn't in a glass or something in a you know jar no it's in a can it's in a can, can. okay that's weird hold on wait you never had like canned iced tea like it's in a pop can but it's iced tea no that sounds weird are you serious huh what does iced tea come Service in norway guaranteed citizens. iced tea yeah. comes in little uh paper uh milk carton thingies oh really in like <laughs> okay that's kind of strange but all right and even then i hate iced tea but sure well, I mean, iced tea, it's pretty good, isn't it? No. I mean, it's just liquid. It's just liquid. If I wanted just liquid, I think I'd just drink water at that point instead of flavoring it with a little bit of leaves. Well, I mean, you, you know the rule, right? Like, calories that are, that are liquid don't count? Death, you're living proof that this is, this is not true. <laughs> okay, okay. So I decided to look up the movie, right? And, I, I mean, the, the basic plot is on wikipedia and i mean if it's a comedy movie it's not gonna, the, looking over a plot synopsis won't help you right but uh i did i did notice that there's one funny gag at the very i guess we'll spoil the end of the movie for anyone who cares no one cares um there's one funny gag at the end of the movie where like the the main guy's girlfriend gets recruited to a similar organization yeah called the society of supportive wives and girlfriends and it's like, okay, that's funny. I get it. I get the, I get the joke. It's progressive humor, but it's still kind of funny. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. It's the progressive stacks. Like, oh, you think you have it hard, Negroes? Well, look at us. 
See, I yep. I enjoy this world though. I see again. I think this could have been a good joke. Like if you read a little bit into the meta commentary of this, right? As, as people did with the Barbie movie. So here we exist mm-hmm. in a world where black people have superpowers, women have superpowers, and yet white men are still in charge of absolutely everything. How fucking amazing <laughs> are we? Yep. Yep. There's there's definitely um. There's definitely promise with this that seems to have gone un- untapped. Like, even the reviews have been awful, because all of the reviews, too, of course, because the problem is this wasn't progressive enough. And so all of the reviews are like, oh, it was a limp-wristed satire. They didn't go far enough. They didn't push the point. It was too much of a comedy for the so progressives. And it was too much of a, this joke wasn't even funny 60 years ago for everyone else, basically. <laughs> yeah, this this sort of thing needs to to hyper lean into the absurdity, which so is what Barbie did, yes. and why Barbie was so successful. Yeah, th- this needed to basically be a '90s comedy sketch, is what this needed to be. They needed to lean full force into it and basically make it the most racist movie in the last twenty years. Yep. Well, you know what? I'll I'll go see it. I'll go see it and I'll I'll report back because I'm now I'm kind of curious. Somebody, uh, go. F- <laughs> Let's not incite anyone to commit a crime, actually, now that I think about it. Because I'm, on, I'm only going on, on the cheap day because uh, it's $4 tickets on Tuesdays, so. $4 tickets, man, that is cheap. Yep. But yes, the, uh, the race, race bait this time around did incredibly poorly like two million dollars is um well let's just say that nobody who worked on this movie is going to be working again for a while in all due likelihood (laughs) yeah yeah i mean hmm i gotta think about it for a minute like if it's just gonna be a movie where the white audience is lectured at about black problems I can't see any white person signing up to go watch that because why would they sit there and take it? And I also can't see any black person signing up to go watch it because it's in in a way it's not it's not meant for them, you know. So, but like if it's if it's actually a a real racial comedy, then I could see it being successful. Yeah, uh, I, a racial comedy would actually be a great moment to clear the clear the air for both sides. I think that would attract both white and black people. But as you say, a white person isn't going to go like, oh, good, the 11th movie this year lecturing me about my fucking whiteness. Oh, fun. Yeah, you already get that from your video games back home. Yeah, and a black person isn't going to want to watch it because like, oh, good. Another black spl- black power movie. Like, okay, I'll I'll go watch Black Panther instead. It does it better with better special effects. <laughs> well, who who was actually in this? Let me let me just see. It was an enormously missed opportunity, and uh, the only lesson that can be learned is that you shouldn't do this. I guess. They're still trying to do the uh, society, uh, the the society, the uh, the spin for it. Uh, society of Magical Negroes titles meant to make people squirm for their own good. They're going to try and pivot this into being somehow self-sacrificing somehow to try and get something <laughs> positive out of this. Like it wasn't meant to be a popular movie, guys. It was meant to be a life lesson or something. Well, Man, I don't think it's going to work. It, I mean, it 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 did run at the Sundance Film Festival. Maybe they should have just left it there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, this was clearly a movie made for a very specific and very small audience, shall we say. Yep. Well, at least now we know that there's a bigger flop than Madame Webb out there. That's good. <laughs> you know, I looked up this... I looked, I looked up the guy who was the director. This is the whitest black guy since Talcum X. <laughs> All right, you have, you get a picture of him. Hold on. Ah, uh, what was his name? Uh, Kobe his Levy. Name is, yes. Yeah, Co- Kobe Levy. Like, what is he? Like a quarter black or something? I might have darker skin than him. Fuck. There we go. I found one with him on a white background, just to fully illustrate. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> now, the, okay, so this is a funny thing as well, where you see in uh, in immigrant societies, like the first generation of immigrants, they come to their country, and most of the time they're they're super grateful, like, oh God, I escaped fucking Iran, thank you, I was gonna get my head chopped off over there. And then yep. the second generation gets a little bit less thankful for because for them it's they're used to it now. They they're living in. Uh, in Norway and Canada, whatever, and they're not, eh, it's just normal for the, them, right? But their parents are still telling them tales about how terrible it was back home, so they're kind of in between. And then the third generation grow up on fairy tales of their homeland, their mystical, magical homeland, where everything was, was great and adventurous and completely different from boring here. And they tend to fetishize it a lot. And this is what we see a lot of in the American, uh, American style as well, where you have a lot of black people fetishizing Africa. Like the entire... Um, oh, what was the name of it? The weird people who think the Africans came from fucking space. Oh, the fucking... The, question. the Yakub guys. Yakubs, yes, the Afrofuturists. <laughs> yeah. Like, there, there's a group of people in America that le legitimately believe that Africans descended to Earth in spaceships and then just okay. left them there, I, I guess. It. Okay. According to the beliefs of the Nation of Islam, Yakub was a black scientist who lived 6,600 years ago and began the creation of the white race. He, <laughs> he is said to have done so through a form of, selecting, through a form of selective breeding, which is referred to as grafting. Well, he was living on on the island of Patmos. <laughs> okay, dokey then. Yeah, yeah. He was born in Mecca. He so was a member of the Meccan citizenship. branch, the tribe of Shabazz. He he acquired the nickname of Big Head because of his unusually large head and his arrogance. At the age of six, he discovered the law of attraction repulsion by playing with magnets. He decided to create new people. Let's see. Wait, hold on. But, he he discovered the theory of attraction and repulsion by playing with magnets? Yep. Who invented the magnets? I don't fucking know. <laughs> but, no, but whoever... <laughs> hold on, hold on a second. Whoever invented the magnets must have come up with this first, surely. So, the insight of the differing, the, the differing magnetic poles led him... It inspired him to create an unlike human being made to attract made to attract others who could, with the knowledge of tricks and lies, rule the original black man. So by the age of 18, he exhausted all knowledge in the universities of Mecca. And he uh, he with 60,000 followers, he went to an island called Palan, which uh, which Muhammad later identified as Patmos. Once there, he established a despotic regime. He started to breed out the black traits of his followers, killing all the darker babies. And after 200 years, he created a brown race. And eventually, over 600 years, he created the white race. Okay. Well, now I know about that, I guess. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought Scientology was a little bit crazy. Yeah, these are basically the black Scientologists. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. The, the, someone in the chat's asking what time era. This was 6,600 years ago. So what is it? 56 BC? No. 46 BC? 40, 4,600 BC, rather. Because <clears throat> this just sounds like the crazier version of, like, Afrocentrism, basically. Because, okay, Afrocentrism. I had to look into this a while ago. Afrocentrism actually started out like a pretty good idea. Uh, where, I forget his, his name, uh, but basically a... Um, a black uh, historian who had been accepted into Harvard, etc., had looked around himself and was like, okay, where's, where, where's all of my history? Like, Because he was super interested in history, he had read tons of history, he was, a, he was an educated professor, clearly a very intelligent person, and he couldn't find any of Africa's history. And so he was like, okay, uh, what happened? And eventually he came to the conclusion that they simply didn't write shit down. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of African history. Like, almost all of it had been written by white explorers, or by Romans, or by Greeks, etc. 
And so he tried to begin a school of studies to expand upon African history, like actual African history, in the same way that we have expanded upon European history, right? Great idea. Why the fuck not? But over the years, it turned into basically Afrofuturism, where shit like Yacoub began appearing, and they started just making shit up, because again, they just didn't write a whole lot of stuff down in Africa. I mean, that's partially true. There were various African empires that rose and fell like anywhere else, and they did have their own form of literacy. But yeah, a lot of the tribes just didn't keep anything. Well, even then, okay, African empires. How, how many can you name? Well, are we, are we counting the Arabs or the various Muslim empires? No. <laughs> okay. Um, the Mali Empire was the big one. The Songhai were an empire. Um, the Ethiopians. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think the Zulu ever got to anything approaching an empire. They tried, though. And I, I don't think they were nearly as literate. The The Zulu kingdom That's about it, though. was was fairly large, uh, but it collapsed really quickly. Like, basically, after Shaka Zulu, it lasted for a few generations and then went extinct. extinct. Yeah. But I no, can... the, 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 Mali, the Mali Empire was around for, like, 500 years. Yeah. But, but even then... That's not a massive empire, if you look at it. Because um, that was in constant war with Songhai as well, and eventually began to decline. Because I can think of Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Songhai, Mali, Ghana, to an extent, uh, the Zulus, which I will grant semi-empire status, uh, the Lundu, and... What, what was the name of those on the coast that the Portuguese wiped out? I can't remember now, but... <laughs> There's a bunch of them. Let me see. Ah, here oh. we go. Actually, this is an excellent... All right, here. Mm -hmm. I found, like, a map with, like, their general areas on the map. So the, these yeah. are the uh, the African empires, right? Almost all of these are uh, geographically large, but geographically nothing. Like, the Songhai, most of that dead empty air desert like we know that because we, we're there now and it's dead empty fucking desert uh mali dead empty desert and jungle like all of these empires were geographically large not so much because they were empires in our sense i would argue but because there wasn't really anything around to stop them that's true but um ethiopia was a literate society that, that kept records and so yes. was mali Yes. So, I mean, we, we, there, there is definitely African history written by Africans out there. Yeah, but uh, even then, like, look at, the, look at the size of this. And we can come up yeah. with, like, four or five empires that had written records on a continent, mm -hmm. what, five times the size of Europe? Yep. This is actually something that I was looking into. This is, this is where you have to get into the really boring gun, guns, germs, and steel stuff. Right? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> where, you know, Europe had the Mediterranean Sea. It had a lot of, uh, a lot of rivers that were easy for navigating. It had good locations for um, for ports, for harbors. Africa has none of that, which is what makes, uh, which is what basically makes life in Africa so difficult. Is you can't you can't travel and you can't trade that easily. You know, there, there's almost no decent shoreline, despite the the continent being that huge, and there's almost no decent rivers for for like traveling up and down. So, basically, exploration into the continent was um, was a no go. Until you had cars. So. Well, actually, see, this is one of the many things I heavily disagree with guns, germs, and steel on. Uh, firstly, uh, no access to good uh, port cities. Absolute nonsense. Africa is fucking enormous. And we Europeans had no problems creating port cities there. Their coastline is huge. As for the access to rivers, this is to a degree correct. But when you look at like the, um, what is it, the, the eastern coast uh, of Africa, there's a lot of ri rivers, like through uh, Niger, Senegal, etc. Uh, you've got, of course, the huge rivers leading into Lake Chad, etc. and so on. But Nile, God fucking help me, Lake Victoria. There was actually a tremendous amount of large riverways that could have been used very easily for very large-scale commerce. In fact, most of them dwarfed the shit out of ours. 
Just real quick, Arch. Uh, is your cable coming loose? Because I'm hearing a lot of fuzzing on your... Only when your your light lights up. It uh, doesn't sound like a Discord issue. It sounds like a, a connection a issue. Fire is the answer. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Here, talk a bit more. Hello, 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 hello. Fuzzy? Okay. No, I mean, I'll, I'll keep I'll keep an ear out for it again, because that specifically Harris, sounded like a, a fuzzy Fire XLR cable answer. if you use XLR for your mic. I do. Uh... Yeah, chat hears it too. Yeah, so I, I had to help Kibbs diagnose his issue. This is like an XLR connection that is not quite connected, a specific type of, of, of buzzing. Like, hold on, that's... everything looks fine. Okay. Well, if that's the case, maybe the cable's finally starting to die. Who knows? Am I still doing it? Nope, not right now. All right. I guess I'll, I'll just listen to Oh, yeah, I'll listen out to it. I'm oh, gonna... it just came back. It just came back. You guys hear that? You ch chat, you hear that? Do you hear that, chat? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's one of those things where, like, usually like, the, the big weakness of the XLR connector is that the, the actual plugs on them they they make this kind of noise and they start to fail, so they wiggled too much or something happened, right? So it's either the plug on your mic or the plug on your soundboard or the plug on the cable. Ah, god damn it! I'm gonna have to order a new XLR cable then. Yep. Anyway, De someone's in the chat says Dev is sidetracking. Don't let him. <laughs> I'm not sidetracking. Service guarantee citizenship. Okay, yeah. The the thing is, from what I remember, is that a lot of the rivers are not as navigable as European rivers or North American rivers. And that, that was a big problem. Harris for, um... the question. Fire is oh, the answer. <laughs> there it was. That was very loud. Did you do anything there? I was wiggling it in the soundboard. Yeah, it was very, very loud when you wiggled that. Here, do it again, that specific juncture. Service guarantees citizenship. Anything? Oh, nope. Okay, am I still fuzzy? Nope, you're good now. Okay. Okay, it might just be a bad connection then. Maybe. Uh, and yes, we are sidetracking a little bit. We'll get back to it in a moment. But again, we'll get back to it. Yeah. I, I, I call bullshit on almost all everything he wrote about Africa. Like the entire idea about the zebras, for example. It's like, oh, the zebra fulfills every requirement I have of an excellent uh, pack animal. But it was a bit aggressive, though. That's why they couldn't use it. Like fucking horse shit. Wild horses were beyond aggressive. We have wild horses today. They're still aggressive and shy of people. Like, we found a way to tame them. They could have too. Well, here, here's the thing, right? And I actually do side with him on the zebras thing. Because horses have, um, they have, they have like, a social structure. They, they, they have, like, a family structure. Zebras don't. And that, that's the big difference, right? If, if an animal has evolved some sort of pack structure, it's very easy for humans to tame them. If the animal hasn't, then it's not. The thing is, though, guess who did tame zebras? Uh, was, it, uh, was it us when we arrived? <laughs> uh-huh, for shits and fucking giggles. <laughs> like, honestly, you, you, can, you can Google, like, pictures of tamed zebras, and there's ass loads of them that random white people tame just for fucking giggles. J just for funsies. <laughs> like, just we didn't even funsies. try. Like... We've even got pictures like of imported zebras carrying, uh, d pulling wagons like carts, just for shits and giggles, purely for shits and fucking giggles. Uh, let me see. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna check this out here. Yeah, it seems like, it seems like you know, after the 1800s. Basically, the process began of of beginning to tame a whole bunch of previously untamable um, animals because we now had the ability to do so, right? But I'm not sure that they could they they could have tamed them thousands of years ago the way that horses were. I don't know, Dev. Like all I'm saying is what what Africa could not do in a million years, Whitey did in a weekend when fucking bored. <laughs> I'm not, hold on, hold on. I'm I'm gonna just see here, Kate. Okay. There's like there's not that many animals that are actually tame, are there? I mean, there's dogs, all right. The, the Chinese first tamed them. Goats, pigs, sheep, cattle. Um. Uh, what else, really? 
I mean, I guess donkeys. Yeah, okay, donkeys. Uh, donkeys. Um, reindeer. That's right. You northerners tra- tamed the reindeer. To an extent. Um, llamas. I think, well, I, that, that was a big thing w- with a CGP Grey video is that the only like work animal that w- that North and South America had access to was the llama, which is why they, you know, they they. They didn't have access to any, basically. Harris, you know, North and yeah. South America have a much better claim to the no easy access to uh, to labor animals than Africa does. Like, mm-hmm. Africa has... I mean, for fuck's sake, we've tamed elephants, basically. I don't know you've tamed elephants yet. I don't think so. No, no, no. Like, fuck, the Carthaginians were taming elephants. The, the Indians were taming huge quantities of elephants, training them to, to work for them, to haul shit for war... No, the elephants were definitely more or less, well, if not domesticated, oh. then tamed on a large scale. Um, bees and moths for honey and silk. We we tamed them. Silkworms. That was the Japanese yeah. too. Yeah. No, I, I remember actually. I remember seeing in that CGP Grey video that like there's really only a dozen animals before the modern era, or sorry, before let's say the Industrial Revolution that humans actually managed to tame. And they were all like Europe and Asia. <laughs> they were all in Europe and Asia, not so much in Africa or North or South America. Uh, all I'm saying is they had time, Dev. They had time. <laughs> Are you saying that? Are you saying that? <laughs> right. So, um, on to the actual main topic of today. After, well, do you want to talk about the movie? Actually, actually, no. You know what? I, we don't know we'll talk about, about it another movie. time. What about the movie? I'll I'll go see the movie. We'll talk about it another time. Okay? Sure. Yes. Uh, just you know, bring a camcorder, I guess. <laughs> God, maybe it'll come out on DVD or something. I don't know. Uh, but yes, we should talk about the movie like properly because I was kind of hoping it would be actually a funny racial comedy. But uh, the main topic of today, Kotaku. So this happened um, what yesterday or the day before, where it came out that Kotaku's um, editor in chief was resigning over disagreement with the governing body uh, of Kotaku, which is uh, what was it? Geo Media? Yeah, Geo Media. Is that who bought it after Gawker fell apart? Yes. <clears throat> Man, Kotaku has been going through just a very slow collapse over the past 10 years, hasn't it? Yes, a very slow but very deliberate uh, collapse. <laughs> so, Geo Media has bought up a fair few. Uh, they've got bought up Gizmodo. Uh, they own The Root, which is an interesting website. Uh, they own the Onion, interestingly enough, as well. So, <laughs> remember that was good. Yes, I do. It was a very long Holy time fuck. ago. The Onion was basically replaced by the Babylon Bee, wasn't it? In essence, yeah. So, I have a I have a, a very quick Onion situation so story, right? So, oh god, it's <laughs> okay. I once owned. A um an, uh, a book by the Onion, and it was just all like, all their fake headlines so and articles like in one big book over the years. But they made a bunch of them going back to 1900. So the idea is like it it, it was sold basically as a uh, here's the front page of every historical Onion newspaper. But they were all fake because the the company opened to what 1988 or something. Mm-hmm. But they went back and they made a bunch of fake like uh, front pages from 1900 onwards and like he's like and they sold it as this historical book so it was like a, it was obviously a joke book but like i you, you could like read it and, and laugh at it. like one of them is how like america actually lost the vietnam war and how the vietnamese were like invading the western shore and stuff it's like okay yeah i get it i get it um and un- unfortunately this book rotted away because i let it sit in the um in the washroom of my college apartment for years i would just look at it while i was taking a shit and that, you know, it sat in there for years and got steam damage from the shower and whatever else. So <laughs> it damage. it disintegrated. But I remember, <laughs> listen, I remember the onion being fucking hilarious. All right, and it had no problem making jokes about any and all political sides or just anything in general. Right Harris now, if you go to theonion.com now, fire is the answer. <laughs> um, 
it's not that funny anymore. They they kind of lost it, and they they kind of went down the same the same route that uh that uh, crack dot com went down, where they were or like college humor. You know, these were funny sites in the two thousands, and then they kind of started shifting more progressive and started getting more woke scoldy and stopped putting out funny content. And now they're putting out content that talks down at their audience. And these are now all dead brands. And then, and so, so the Babylon Bee has shown back up and uh, sorry, the Babylon Bee kind of, you know, arose to fill in the, uh, to fill in the gap in the market. And the Babylon Bee is, is like considered alt right now because they laugh at everyone. And it's like, what the, what, what happened, guys? I mean, we all know what happened. This like, we were asking this question like six or seven years ago. We all actually know what happened, but it's still kind of strange to see. Service guarantee. There, sorry, there was my Babylon B ramble. Go ahead. Well, um, how do you much do you know about the uh, Kotaku editor in chief resigning thing? I do know that the Kotaku editor in chief, I think, was the same woman who wrote the article against the Sweet Baby Ink Detector page, right? Uh, no, that was the senior editor. This is another woman entirely. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> okay, listen. For a site this small and this fucking dead, how many editors do you need? Well, they had seven journalists, I think. Uh, and I think they had two or three yeah. editors in total. All right. Because uh, the one you're okay. thinking about is Alyssa Mercante. Uh yeah, Alyssa Mercante, and she was like, you can't be racist against white people. I remember that was a big thing. I think she also recently said, didn't she recently say, I would I would rather go back to sex work than write what Kotaku wants me to write now in the wake of Sweet Baby? Was that her? Yep, that is her. Uh, quote, I'm okay. just going to go back to sex work because at least then when I get fucked a lot, I'll get paid well for it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's what you mean by the title, right? Game journals would rather become whores than write about games. Yes, like that's that's not a hyperbole. That isn't something I made up. We have actually literally a games journalist saying that instead of being forced to write guides about video games, she'd rather get railed by strangers. I, like, was was she a prostitute? Did she have an OnlyFans? Like, what? <laughs> what? I, I don't know. What does she mean by sex work? <sighs> Okay, hold on. Let me Google Alyssa Mercante sex work. Yeah, I'm gonna look it up too. Um, I I somehow doubt it's gonna be on her LinkedIn page, but I guess <laughs> I'll check. Oh man, this this is one of those times. Where, like, you know that meme where the guy like is annoyed, but he still like undoes his fly. I guess I'll fap to this fuck. <laughs> it's like I have no other particular choice. <laughs> um, Alyssa Mercante is a renowned liar, racist, and a very bad journalist. Well, I mean, that sounds true, but that doesn't tell me anything about her nudes. Yep. Um... Nothing immediately leaps out. Well, she so, tweeted a year ago, if I ever get fired, I'm going back to bartending and sex work. Bartending and sex work sounds like she was a prostitute. Yes, uh, it does sound as if she might have been the uh, street kind of girl. Oh, God. You know, I'll... <laughs> okay. I, I, would, I would definitely take an, an, a former OnlyFans model over a former street hooker, personally. Oh, I'd yeah. choose between one or the other. Oh, yeah, no questions. Like, OnlyFans or okay. So her, her vajayjay is out there. Sure, that's not ideal. But at least it hasn't been invaded by about 52 men on a weekend. <laughs> but, yeah, there, there it so, is. It's, uh, it's legitimate. Games journalists Fires would rather be prostitutes Fires than talk about answer. video games. Because um, <laughs> now, to be fair, the the thing they said to do was staff at the site will be expected to create fifty guides per week. All right, that sounds a little bit extreme. How are they going to write fifty guides per week? Well, another little leak uh, came out. 
uh, from one of the people having leaked the conversation they had with uh, management. Uh, you know what? Fuck it. Here's a small cup of tea. Management doesn't even care about the quality of the guides. They want us to aggregate them from other sites, like a literal content mill that they're destroying people's livelihood gags, me not in a good way. Yes, so <laughs> this course. is how they want to create the 50, 50 guides uh, a week. Because basically, Geo Media doesn't give a fuck about Kotaku's hard-hitting journalism, <laughs> nor does anyone else for that matter. What they want is clicks. And the yep. entire infrastructure of these sites is guide aggregates. It's what's the current video game? How do you get the weird hat in Hogwarts Legacy? How do you get the vocation in Dragon's Dogma? That is what the entire games industry revolves around now. Yep. How, how, how do you get uh, Tifa or Eris or Yuffie in the Final Fantasy VII date at the Golden Saucer? Which one do you want? Yeah. Yes. Like here. Shit like that. I've got like a games games news aggregator site, which I occasionally use to troll for, for new stuff. And it's like, okay, uh, quest walkthrough in Dragon's Dogma 2. What vocation to pick in Dragon's Dogma 2? How to unlock the warfare vocation? How to unlock the magic armor, etc. As like half of these, uh, should you buy the Ornet box in Dragon's Dogma 2? Half of these journalistic pieces are literally just fucking walkthroughs and guides and dumbass questions like that is all this is gaming journalism is already nothing but one big incestuous aggregating machine wait a second right there on the front page society of magical negroes <laughs> service guarantee citizenship why is that on there well because when gaming journalism isn't doing gaming they're doing this and <laughs> And like that, because that's the thing too, right? <laughs> what does these game journalists actually want Harris to talk about? Question. That's Fire what they the want answer. to talk about. They want to talk about what they consider to be the news. Society of Magical Negroes on Polygon. This has nothing to do with Polygon whatsoever, but it is the cultural nonsense. Because that's what they want to cover. That's what yes, they consider yeah. news. Basically, so, they want to be YouTubers, but they don't have the charisma to fucking hack it. <laughs> to be fair, if they didn't have the charisma, they'd just start making YouTube videos. I mean, I'm sure Kotaku has a YouTube channel, right? I'm sure they I'm sure do. They like, if they had one per, okay, if they were smart and they had one person there who was like halfway charismatic, they just say, "Listen, you make the videos, and hopefully you can take off." Right? Yeah, so here, here's the thing. This sounds like what happened with the Escapist like six months ago. Remember that story? Yes. Yeah. So basically. Someone had bought out the Escapist, and it had been handed down through several different, uh, several different owners, and no one really knew what to do with it. The only oh, successful oh. show was was Yahtzee. Um, Una momento there, Dev. Out... Okay, all right. What's up? I oh, found the Kotaku YouTube. YouTube channel. Okay, what's it on? has three hundred and sixty four thousand subscribers, which sound pretty impressive. Yeah. And then you look at their views: seven hundred views three days ago, one point four thousand views nine days ago. 2.3 thousand views 10 days ago 1,000 views yeah. 2,000 views see I, yeah I, I think the Kotaku brand is just too damaged like the escapist could could do this and we've seen them do this now with second wind but I think I think it's like Kotaku's just just done I don't think there's any pulling this up you know because that that if you were smart and you had a brand that was worth saving, that's what you would do, right? You would have a YouTube channel. You'd have some of your best editors or your best writers start making YouTube videos. But I don't think that's going to happen with these guys. I think they're I think they're fucked. Well, uh, the the best writers and the editors here. Uh, let's see. the The only stuff that gains traction is Baldur's Gate three narr narrator reads your down bad tweets. So basically. When they can use their inside industry connections to gain exclusives or exclusive access to people, that is the only thing that anyone wants out of them. All of their actual stuff is absolute garbage that nobody wants to know, know about, nobody wants to care about. Yep, yep. Um, yes, yeah, so, so where I was going with um, 
with uh, Second Wind and the Escapists, the same thing happened with them, right? Is that they were they they ended up being bought out, then bought out, and bought out by somebody else, and the ownership changed hands, and the new owners had no clue what to do with this property, and they're just like, "Fuck it, we got to make money off you somehow. Start start doing this, right?" And but the, the difference is that they had Yahtzee, right? Yep. And Yahtzee had become friends with everyone else at the Escapist. And it was at the point where, yeah, even though Yahtzee was keeping the whole operation afloat and the friends, like they worked hard, but they weren't the main draw, Yahtzee cared about them. I had an opportunity to talk to, talk to uh, Nick Calandra, who is the editor of, he's he's now the editor-in-chief of Second Win, which is the company that they, st- that they, that they started after they all left, um, after they all left uh, the escapist and he's, he's like a very lefty kind of guy. Right. I don't think he, he appreciated some of my past, but, but nonetheless, I, I had an opportunity to talk to him and he, um, he basically confirmed that even though Yahtzee could very easily go it alone and just hold up his own channel on his own, he had basically, um, become very good friends with all the people who are currently at the escapist and they wanted to, like, he knows he's the big draw, but they wanted to do this as a team. Right. So they all decided to leave together and start their own company. And now they're successful without um, some overhead pushing, so, so, someone, someone at the top pushing unrealistic expectations on them, right? And, and, and yeah, they're all very left-leaning people and they, you know, they, they formed a worker co-op and you know how these sort of things go. But because they're all friends, the worker co-op thing will probably work out for them. Um there's a lot of parallels with the, with the Kotaku story because now you have like corporate over overlords who don't exactly know what they've purchased. And they're just like, we got to make some money off you guys somehow. So fuck it, do this. And now you're, now you're seeing the staff revolt. The difference is that Kotaku doesn't have a Yahtzee character. <laughs> they don't have someone that people actually like. They're all hated. All right. The corpos at the top are hated. And also the property of Kotaku itself and the people inside of Kotaku are all hated as well. So like, there's no victory for them this time. Like the, the, I don't think I don't think you're going to see a successful revolt against the owners of Kotaku the way that that happened with the Escapist. You know what I mean? Well, the thing with um, with Yahtzee is Yahtzee was the guy, the one guy, and the worker co-op thing that can that can work out uh, basically so long as everyone else is okay and recognizes the fact that they are nothing without him. That is what the entire relationship mm-hmm. rests on, basically. And it was also then rests upon how Yahtzee is with that, too. Because there are some people who are more gracious than others, shall we say, when put in that role. And he seems like the very uh, gracious kind of guy. Because when you have the opportunity to leave and start over anew, you have no obligation to drag anyone along with you, but he chose to do so. Which seems to indicate that he's actually a pretty, you know, chill dude. Well, the way the story was described to me is that there was like back when Yahtzee was first brought on the Escapist, um, there was a like the Escapist was growing really rapidly, and there was a bunch of talent on there. And then over the years, slowly things kind of fell apart. Um, and then for a few years there, Yahtzee was just by himself, mm-hmm. and no one else cared about anything else going on at the Escapist. People were getting fired left and right. People were leaving the site, and for like two or three years there, it was just Yahtzee and a bunch of corporate owners, and that's it. And so Yahtzee actually felt he was kind of isolated there from the rest of the internet because the the escapist owned the the Yahtzee brand. They they own zero punctuation. They still do, which is why he had to change branding when he left, right? Um, but then when the new owners bought the escapist, they brought in they brought in Nick Calandra and other guys, and they said, "Listen, start making other shows to make the escapist more profitable." And so they all started working together. And like Yahtzee said that basically he really enjoyed having a team behind him and having friends. And he's like, you know, I've been by myself now for like three or four years and it sucked. But now I have like, like the escapist put some guys behind me and they're helping me with my videos now. And I've actually really grown to like these people. So when they all started abusing those guys, they all decided to leave together. And Yahtzee was like, of course, I'll, I'll do this with you because we're friends now, you know? Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to go back to an environment where it was just the corpos at the top of the company and him and no one else. So it was, it was, it was a thing based not on, on material wealth, but based on friendship. Well, based on intermingled codependency, sounds like. <laughs> but they for, describe um, themselves as all being good friends. <laughs> I'm sure they do, Dev. I'm sure they do. I can't wait for it to implode. That'll be funny to me. You think it will? You think you think that'll fall apart? Mm, 
Power imbalances, Dev, rarely go well in the long term, but we'll see. See, this is one of the problems with communism. <laughs> like, <sighs> relationships in which you have a severe power imbalance often don't work out unless one party is significantly more submissive than the other, which is incidentally why men and women exist together. <laughs> Oh, man. See, now, Arch, you are sounding like a communist, right? Because communists say this all the time. Like, you know, there's a severe power imbalance between employers and labor. So it's always exploitative. Capitalism is necessarily exploitative. Yeah, but that's fine. Arch, so long as the power imbalance is strict enough. <laughs> so long as it's a complete one-sided railroad, it also works. We call this domestic abuse, Dev. And it, there's some of the longest-lasting relationships out there. <laughs> in terms of kotaku though to get to go to go back to the actual topic um it seems kind of like the same thing where you have corporate like a corporate a corporate overlord that has purchased this property has no fucking clue what to do with it has to make money off their purchase somehow and they're like listen you need to do this now the difference is that they can't rebel and make their own thing the way that second win did you know the way that yahtzee did and so this is not going to go good for them, I don't think. This is not going to go well. But you also have to ask, like, what would if you were given the keys to Kotaku and you weren't just going to burn it down, what would you even do with it, you know? Well, like, what, what value does the brand actually bring? Because you know what? When people think games journalism, they think IGN first and foremost. And what does IGN do nowadays? It's mostly walkthroughs. So they're probably thinking Kotaku needs to do what IGN does, write some walkthroughs. Because no one gives a shit about the social justice stuff. Nobody gives a shit about this reporting. All right. But people are, are looking for walkthroughs. So you should be writing these guides. That's probably what, that, that's probably their thought process. And it's not necessarily wrong. Oh, it's, it's absolutely correct. We, we know this. In fact, um, we often heard the journalists whine about this thing themselves. That all of these websites do the exact same thing. The exact same content in the exact same way covering the exact same subject material. And in reality, there was probably only room for like three or four websites like this in total. But now that we have several, there, there's not enough room for them. And so the competition is over Google, basically. Whomsoever guides get at the top of Google wins. Everyone else loses. And this is why they need to put out so many guides. This is why from a corporate standpoint, they want 50 guys from every employee. They want like 250 guides out there a week to just hammer that algorithm mill to be like, okay, we get something on top, something because they need the hits, the hits, the hits, the hits, because they need income. Yep. And they actually bring up... Um, the other leaker says, last thing I'll say is this someone at the top told us just get guides done because the AV club watches full seasons of shows and still produces their stories. That alone is proof they don't understand what we do. See, this is correct because the AV club is actually what Kotaku want. Like this is the content mill where they talk about shows constantly. They cover every rumor about shows constantly. They make shit up half the time and they just hammer, 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 hammer. Like, this is the advantage of having, like, seven people, because you can pump out, like, 10, 12 articles every day to smash that algorithm. And, but the problem is, the Kotaku writers think they're so much better than this. That's the thing. Oh, they, that's why, how we know that they don't understand what we do. They think they're journalists. They think they're Lois Lane here, right? Like, uh, chasing the story, yeah. battling Gamergate, fighting for justice. No, you're a fucking automated typewriter. That is all you are. Well, the thing is, I think they might be thinking of the Kotaku of 10 to 15 years ago. Because like, if, if we're comparing Gamergate 1 to what we're now calling Gamergate 2 with the Sweet Baby stuff, the influence of the game journalists have has massively diminished over the past decade, right? They actually were the, the they actually were the gatekeepers of the industry in 2014. Uh -huh. Now they were starting to lose that to the YouTubers, and they've completely lost it to the YouTubers now. But I think a lot of them are like they still think that they have that much power when they actually don't, because things have just moved on away from them. Yeah, and I also remember this um, back in the day of Game Gear One. TB had an interview with the um, the guy. I think he, was he running Kotaku or founding it? I don't remember. 
where basically the Kotaku guy's point of view was that they weren't aiming for impartiality or objectivity. Instead, they were aiming for personalities. So that when you went to read a guide or a review by a person, you would know that person. You would know their biases, you'd know their preferences, and you'd take that into account. So you'd come there almost as much for the persona as for the review itself. Now, of course, we return then to the problem of Kotaku's YouTube channel, in that if they had charisma, they'd be YouTubers. They wouldn't be Kotaku writers. Yeah, because, I mean, what what they're describing there is technically correct when it comes yep. to YouTubers, right? Yeah, absolutely. That YouTubers, you know, they're not impartial. They are people, but you know their personalities. You know that, like, you know if your interests line up with theirs, so... You know, if a YouTuber that doesn't like RPGs does not recommend an RPG, well, you know, you know, not to, not to think that the RPG is bad, right? Because he's not an RPG guy; he's a shooter guy, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Um, that article that you mentioned, I vaguely recall it. Was it was it Stephen Tatillo who wrote that back in the day, like where they said that we don't want to be impartial? Uh, he might have written it too, but I remember it from an interview he had with Total Biscuit on a live stream. Many, many years ago. Hmm. I don't remember. I don't remember the. I don't remember the interview, but I do remember the article, where they said we're not interested in being objective or impartial. We we want to basically like start conversations and mix things up, and it's like that's just a nice way of saying that you have an agenda, and you're you you are activist press, not not actual journalists. Yes. And that is, of course, what we're seeing right now. They are too good to write about games, despite being games journalists, because they never wanted to be games journalists. It was always about the agenda for them. They, they literally, like, this is the actual white savior complex, the fetishization of it all. These people view themselves as the people operating the underground railway or something, right? This is really important to them. There's... And there's Nazis everywhere, and there's white supremacists everywhere, and they must fight the good fight. And how do they do it? By writing articles about the society of the magical Negroes on Polygon to zero people watching. <laughs> how do they fight the Nazis? By writing articles about how, how terrible the Jews are in Palestine right now. Let me see. Oh, God, yeah. It's, okay, so here. Um, you probably saw this. This was the Verge article on Gamergate, right? Mm-hmm. The return of Gamergate is smaller and sadder. Yep. Yeah, but it's also more victorious. And I want to point out comments. Zero. Zero comments. This has been out for about a week now. Like, they have no audience. Nobody, nobody watches, nobody reads this more correctly. Nobody's interested in this. Well, I wonder if they're just not allowing the comments to come through. Because they're all like negative, so they're not letting them through. Possibly. They're all comments but... right now. I mean, hell, oh, no, but... it, it, it says comments are closed in the story. Yeah, <laughs> they ban comments. That's why. That's why there's none. Yeah. But that, that just proves my point even harder, doesn't it? Like, if the only comments are the comments that they can't allow to be seen. <laughs> yep. It's not just ign It's not people are merely just apathetic towards them. They're actively antagonistic. The, the, here's the thing. So part, part of this is just that the way Paris we consume content has Fire changed. People <laughs> now would rather watch videos or listen to podcasts than read articles or read books. That's just an, an, the, the advancement of technology, just how it is. Um, however, another part of it is that these people are no longer even trying to be objective. They're no longer even trying to account for their own biases. So people are just abandoning them, Right. It's a one-two punch where you might have some written websites survive if they actually attempted to be objective, even though technology is not swinging their way anymore. But all of these ones where they don't even try to be objective, I think they're all just going to die. Almost certainly. And this was kind of Geo Media's last ditch attempt, I think, to try and turn Kotaku into something. But the 
uh, journalists all, I presume, have basically unionized and threatened to quit and stuff, uh, because Alyssa Mercante, the white people, you can't be racist towards them, said Kanaku staff had a somewhat productive meeting with management. Expect news to continue coming from us, at least for now. Your support and your voices certainly helped, so thank you. So, this is essentially the geo media surrendering on Kotaku and going, okay, you're still going to be allowed to do your news, but probably they're also going to have to do X amount of, like, guides or something, right? So it's a middle-of-the-road thing when neither side is happy. And for a website that has been failing for about 10 years, weirdly enough, I don't think a compromise is really going to work out for either side. Yeah. Honestly, like, I, I don't think anything is going to work. I think... Like, even if they completely reformed Kotaku and had all new people and actually just wrote stuff that people wanted to read, I don't think, I think it's done. I think the, the brand itself is just too tarnished. Like, I don't think anyone would come back to, would come back to Kotaku, you know? Well, <laughs> okay, so this is, this is a great little, uh, little thing here, so... One of the big things when you talk about the brand being tarnished is not just Kotaku, it's gaming journalism in its entirety. Uh, here's a uh, article about Dragon's Dogma 2. So Dragon's Dogma 2, have, have you played it or seen it, Dev? Um, I've seen a bit about it. I know that there's currently some, um, some sort of backlash about purchasing save slots, which sounds fucking retarded, but I don't know the whole story. So it came out. And it had microtransactions. And uh, nobody knew about this. Uh, it hadn't been really talked about. And a lot of people were just like, what the fuck? Microtransactions in the single player game? Uh, you, you Also, there, there are no save slots. You can have one character. One character only. You can't even delete oh. that character. If you want to do a new character, you have to manually delete your save game files in Steam. Oh my god. That's fucking ridiculous, dude. It is. And, again, the microtransactions caught everyone by complete surprise. Like, what the fuck do you mean microtransactions, right? So, what, what happened? Why didn't we know about this? Well, it turns out that, yes, the reviewers did know about the microtransactions, says this guy. Um, I've seen the review guide, so the official review guide handed out by Capcom to the reviewers mention microtransactions. All microtransactions are listed there. All prices are listed. Max number of purchases you can make for each item are listed. The information about microtransactions were put out by Capcom in detail to the reviewers who chose not to disclose it. Why? Oh, but... It, it just it wasn't very relevant. It's just, it's just it's not not very relevant, Dev. Forty dollars of <laughs> microtransactions, just not very relevant, you know. Man, Capcom's gone downhill. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> they have, but they're still still a long way behind the gaming journalists. Mm -hmm. It's like, can you imagine, like how? divorced from your audience must you be to think that 40 bucks of microtransactions in a single player game in 2024 is not a relevant fact to mention <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean i i maybe they're trying hold on Maybe they're trying to avoid getting blacklisted again because Kotaku's mm -hmm. already been blacklisted from getting Nintendo games early and Bethesda games early, and I think Bioware games early. Like Kotaku's on K Kotaku's on a few blacklists. Yep, and that's probably probably it. That you're probably correct. It's probably because the um, the Capcom sent them the review guide, the whole guide, and at some point they had a little quick word with the industry. It's like so. This um, this part about the microtransactions, mm. not uh, not 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 very relevant, don't you think? That's not so very important. No, no, nobody cares about this. So, I decided to look this up. I was curious, right? Because you 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 saying that like Kotaku isn't reporting on what people want to hear. That that's. I think that, that really rings true, and it's, it's rung true for a while, right? Yeah, so for gaming journalism I, I, as a whole, like, I they had, are pathological yeah, lies. I, I had to dig this up. I had to go way back, okay? I had to do some digging to find this. And this, is an, this is an archived article from, two, from October 
fourth, two thousand and four. Okay, and it says Gawker Media. We're where the boys are. Okay, and this uh, is take a Gawker screenshot of it, please. Like my uh, archive links do uh, not open for me recently for reasons unknown. Sure, I'll take a screenshot. Thank you. But the TLDR of the article, oh, basically. There we go. This one actually does. Oh, no it mind. Open? It's open. Okay. The TLDR of the article is that Gawker is positioning itself as basically a company that is focusing on the male demographic, and they've opened Kotaku to be their anime and video games branch mm-hmm. of of their operation. Yep. And this this was 2004, right? So this, this is like the era of Spike TV Service when you could like actually a- actively market towards men and have things for men and they would sell because of course they would because they're half the fucking population, right? So it's very interesting to see like we're going to set these places up to be f- to, to be about things that guys are interested in and we're going to market to guys. And then that's how they get started and that's how they they become popular. And then as soon as they're like, oh, yeah, all the people we marketed to, you're all evil. Then they start declining. It's like, well, what did you guys fucking think would happen? Weird. <laughs> Mysterious. Yeah, no, uh, they got taken over by by activists. Like, the new crop of people who were coming up and seeking jobs in the industry, they weren't gamers. Or at least they weren't gamers first and foremost. Because this thing. The primary difference between an activist and anyone else is that the activist will always put the cause ahead of anything else. The cause must always be the most important thing. And so whilst an activist can be a fan of, say, 40k, they will never place 40k in front of their activism, which is why you cannot talk to an activist about a hobby without making it about their activism. Like, this is why... Pronounced leftists cannot be in 40k. I, I, I fir- th- fundamentally believe that they cannot exist in entertainment because they will never be about the entertainment. They are programmed to always try to make it about the activism. It's like having a fucking vegan over for dinner going like, oh, you know, my vegan lifestyle. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I do know what you mean. I do know what you mean. Um, but, like, all of these places, they are starting to fail. And the ones that aren't failing, like IGN, for example, they have they have switched over to um, guides and also just straight reporting. Yep. In general, you know, IGN's actually been pretty good for that, uh, more or less, right? So, yeah, like, I don't know. I don't know what the fuck their plan is here, you know? Like, it seems like the people who are working at Kotaku are arguing against management when management actually wants to do the right thing. And the people arguing against Kotaku might, or sorry, arguing, yeah, arguing against management might actually win this conflict. But what are they winning? Like they're winning the ability to keep writing articles that no one reads, to be the laughing stock of the internet, to further tank the company, to like to to ensure that that their colleagues get fired down the road because they're not going to making they're not going to generate any income for this company. Like what what did they win really? Well, that's the thing. I I don't think they. I, not that they don't care. I simply think that they don't understand. These people view themselves as the heroes of history, basically. They're the good guys. The good guys can't lose. Surely, if they just keep their heads down, they'll win in the end. Because this is all just the patriarchy or the white supremacists fighting against them, right? Trying to enforce their mm. capitalism on them. Sooner or later, comrade, we will emerge victorious. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it could just be delusion, yeah. I, I think it. I think it is delusion, honestly, because these people have access to the back end. They they know they're not earning their salaries. It's like their entire YouTube channel, right? Which which gets something like thirty, forty thousand views in a month. That ain't fucking paying for shit. Yeah, and in fact, they, man. I keep coming back to this point. I don't think there's any way to uh, to fix this, you know. No, like I, like, I think I I think the, the Kotaku brand is so damaged that even if they did everything right, purge all the people, get new people, redouble their efforts on their YouTube channel, I think the brand itself is just it's just too hated now by gamers. It's it's not coming back. Yep, the brand of Kotaku is hated, and just gaming journalism 
it, it is synonymous with lying activists now. I don't think there is any salvaging it. Like, it's going to be wiped out, in essence, and eventually we will get wiped out as well, by AI, probably, and then eventually that AI will be wiped out as well. Like, their time has simply passed, and they did most of this to themselves. I mean, there's still room for, I believe, written websites out there. I mean, for fuck's sake, mangas are still doing great. There is still a market for fucking webcomics and so on. Like, I don't think it... I don't think written media in and of itself is outdated yet, although we are probably heading in that direction, as you said. But when written media is nothing but lies and activist bullshit... <laughs> You've zeroed out a very small percentage of the overall market there. Yep. That's all true. Um, I'm trying to think about this. Is Dev trying to find a way to protect the gaming journalists? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. It's just... It, it's, it's like, okay, when you... When it was a lot... When it was a lot harder for the common person to get access to certain mm. subcultural spaces, mm, yes. journal uh, uh, journalists like this had more of a point, right? So back when E3 existed, and it mattered, and it was still good, and not everyone could go to it, the journalists could go to it, and they, and they could come back to their websites and to their magazines with troves of, of exclusive information about upcoming games. And that actually had value, right? Yep. But that environment doesn't exist anymore. So, what value do do the um, d does let's say the enthusiast press in a subculture? What value do they bring to the table in a world where more people have access to the very information that they used to only have access to? And the value is almost nothing. There's almost no value, in fact. Yeah, and this was eventually also what kind of killed uh, video game reviewing on YouTube, in my opinion, where there's only now a, a very small handful of established channels that do reviews, and they've kind of taken over the the space of the old gaming magazines and uh, websites. Because most of us gamers now are so deep into our hobby that we don't really need to be told anymore what, what, what game is good. We probably figured out what we like pretty well now. And so the gaming websites became more catered to the casual uh, side of things. That was probably what they were leaning towards. And so they thought, okay, casual means young, hip, progressive, right? That turned out to be a very bad idea. But because they, they also fundamentally misread the casual gaming audience. The casual gaming audience. And by this, I mean like the people who game as a very peripheral hobby, right? Uh, the, the Call of Duty frat bros. They buy Call of Duty. They, they don't need a video game journalist to tell them if Call of Duty is good. They buy Call of Duty. Like the same with FIFA. You know, the FIFA player doesn't go like, oh, I wonder what there's happening in FIFA 2024. No, they, <laughs> they know. They expect football, and that's about it. And as you mentioned, now that they don't have that gatekeeping power, that they don't have access to that exclusive information anymore, and that was the only thing that we saw on the Kotaku side, which was actually getting traction, the exclusive stuff. What reason is there for them to exist? Yeah, it's not quite gatekeeping. Not this time. It's more like... It, it's more like... Back in the day, information traveled more slowly just just by necessity because that's how technology was back then. So, you know, before YouTube and you were getting your Nintendo powers in the mail like I was, for example, or your electronic gaming monthlies or whatever they were, not everyone could, you know, open up the internet and watch a video or a stream from the latest E3 conference. Yep. But these companies could afford to send a guy out there to attend them and report back and then write articles and get screenshots and, you know, make a whole production out of it. And then you buy the magazine. So because of changes in technology, their job has basically become obsolete because if we want to watch uh, an E3 or whatever is going to replace Heresy E3 in the future, question. we can just do that Fire ourselves because answer. it's all online now, right? <laughs> Um, a lot of the, a lot of these shows are open to the public. In fact, so if you want to buy a ticket and make a vacation out of it, you can go there yourself. Um, 
this idea that also when, when we were younger, especially when, when when we were kids, when uh, you know people our age, Arch, when we were you know millennials, we were kids. You know, you, you want to get a video game, you have to wait for your birthday for your parents to buy it for you. So that you know, you might hear of a game and then you see it in Nintendo Power, and then three months later you get it for your birthday. So that's a lot of waiting, right? So there's there was added value in the build up to getting the game because information moved slower. But now a new game comes out. You immediately buy it on Steam or buy it on the Nintendo eShop or any other consoles, you know, uh, equivalent shop. Download it. You have it within an hour. You don't, even got, you don't even have to leave your house. Your house, right? So, because information just due to technology improving moves so much faster, the the fast track that journalists had to getting new information quickly no longer exists. So there's no reason for their jobs to exist anymore. And yeah. that's not a gatekeeping thing. It's more of just a natural progression of tech thing. Well, it, it's, it's yes, but it's also partly gatekeeping because they have access to the industries in ways that a lot of other people don't, and which is being actively denied to people as well. Uh, this is why you mentioned blacklisting as being so important, right? Because if these companies, when the only yeah, thing they have, yeah, yeah, when the only thing they have is exclusivity, Getting told by Bethesda that you don't get early access to their games is really bad fucking news. Yep, but then that that kind of has its own that that has its own problems, right? Because let's say that Bethesda only and actually I think Bethesda did this. I think I think they only gave out early advanced copies of Starfield to uh, to journalists and to YouTubers that previously pr uh, praised Bethesda games. Yep. Right. Oh, absolutely. And that can be a problem now. The gaming yeah. companies are very guilty of this as well. Very guilty of this. Because they've seen the system that they figured to exploit. Because as information moves quicker, so does reviews. Like Back in the day, you had to send Total Biscuit a copy, and he would be honest about it, because that was his brand. But as there were 500 Total Biscuitses, well, you send it out to the 500 others, then you sift out the ones that say things you don't like, and you still have 300 reviewers giving you the review you want, instead of rolling all of your dice on one guy. Yep. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, 200 to 300 viewer Andes on Twitch who would love to blow up to uh, 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 views, and if they get a, a copy of the game, they can stream a day early. That'll help them. You know, Absolutely. so they'll do it. Yeah. And they'll be very grateful for it as well. So th this is really a multifaceted problem, it seems. It's not just journalists, but right now journalists are feeling the effects of the negative parts of the problem that are affecting them. And some yeah. of it's just their own fault. And some of it is just the, the, the passage of time and new technology kind of making them obsolete. It is. I am just happy that I got to see the end of Kotaku. Although we're probably still a year or two away before they actually shut their doors. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've shut their doors like three times, and they, they've always come back, you know? Yep. <laughs> like, Hulk Hogan destroyed Gawker, and Kotaku somehow survived, so... Yeah, because people were willing to buy it. Because they, they were still perceived value in the brand, but uh, if Geo Media shuts them down, I... Like, if Deadspin couldn't find a buyer, like a sports thing couldn't find a buyer... I can't imagine who would pick up Kotaku at this point. We should do it. <laughs> no, seriously, we'll like we'll crowdfund. We'll get we'll get Sargons on board. We'll get like a bunch of people who are you know YouTubers, kind of all in our general sphere of the internet. We'll get them all on board, and we'll buy Kotaku, and then we'll do something that's actually good with it. I Dev, I feel like just making a separate site would be more useful at that point. Yeah, but this is like a moral victory, you know? Like, imagine planting your flag on the corpse of Kotaku. That's true, I suppose. That's true. All right. I'll move on to some <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, You know what I'll do? Yeah, I'll change my name to Short Fat Kotaku. <laughs> that would That's be funny. We'll do, yeah. <laughs> Ah, uh, Obdulio. Apparently, Kotaku had has backed down about the Gaia thing, and the chief who was quitting is now going to release a hit piece on YouTuber Melanie Mac, according to Bounding Into Comics. Yep, they well, they do appear to have I backed saw down. No, I saw the Melanie Mac thing. Yeah, um, the Alyssa Mercante chick is working on an anti-Melanie Mac hit piece. 
I I know nothing about Melanie Mac except for that one thing Rags mentioned in our super secret chat. So you know, um, Melanie Mac Service is uh, she's one of Stuttering Craig's rotating co-hosts on Side Scrollers. I think she's there like once or twice a week. Um, she was I think actually a gaming's journalist way back in the day. We're talking like ten years ago, but she moved into YouTube. She kind of saw where the wind was blowing. Um. In recent years, she's become much more of an evangelical Christian. She was definitely not this religious in 2018. But she, but she's not necessarily. Um, of course, well, no, she's offensive. She loves she loves saying slurs and making fun of people like we all do. But like, I, I don't get the vibe that she would she would you know kill me for being bi the way an Islamist would. It's one of those things where it's like I disagree with her, but we can coexist if you know what I mean. You're not by gay. Either way, point still stands. Is that like she? She seems to be the, the, the kind of person who's like, I think being gay is a sin, but I'm going. You still have the freedom to do it. It's that sort of thing, right? It's like okay, yeah, I, I, I can coexist with a person like that. That's fine. I mean, yes, but I, I immediately then feel as if the slippery slope is is probably true on both sides because I think I've seen this before too. But uh... yeah, I've seen it before too, but. And, and who knows, maybe maybe deep down she actually is, you know, sharpening the sword. But I don't get that vibe from her, personally. The Slippery Slope exists. I'm not sure if she'll fall down it. She hasn't so far. And besides, from what Google is showing me, she's decidedly more attractive than Alyssa Mercante, so that's one thing. Well, she went viral a few years ago for being the carnivore girl. She only eats meat and butter, and that's it. <laughs> okay. Have you seen the pictures of her, like, only eating, like, just eating raw sticks of butter? No, and I don't know if I want to now. Hold on, I'm going to show you. As usual, no means very little to Dev. It's not a word in his fucking language. I bet you, like, yeah. Dev has a long, dirty history as a serial rapist. I guarantee fucking to it. You sure? Like, Dev, no, I, mean, we... I don't recognize I'm... that word. People keep saying it to me, but I just don't understand. Here, I'm posting it. Take a look at this. Yep, she just eats sticks of butter. <sighs> she just eats sticks of... Is that that's her, that's her thing? Is that okay? Well, there you go. Um, I've learned something new today. Are you sure this isn't a joke? Surely you can't just eat butter. Yep, that's all she she eats only meat and butter, and that's it. Okay. And it there there is a certain um. There's a certain diet. What is it? Is it, is it keto? Is like pure keto? Where you eat absolutely zero carbohydrates, it's only dietary fat and protein. And that's what she's on. Okay, okay. It's one of those things where, like, it can actually be very unhealthy for you unless you eat certain types of, of high vitamin fat. I would imagine it would require a very specific diet, yes. But, uh, yeah, uh, more freedom to her, I do suppose. Uh, Tim France has been a member for two months. A woe betide the communist who is late, gay, and incapable of taking the L. All, all of those things are true. It's correct. Uh, Zero Firewater. Archley, why do you not core power washing Archcast with the purple stateswoman so you can be monetized? That's a good point. So my... I don't know if I told you about this, but I can talk about whatever I want whilst power washing. No matter how racist, no matter how obscene, no matter how perverted, YouTube gives me the green icon. Here... I really? put an objective truth in the title, yellow yellow icon, before before anything is even, before a single word is spoken. I think it's because YouTube, um, for the most part, only looks at titles. If you do, like, let's play of a game, part 18, and then say the craziest shit, you're not going to get caught. I don't know. I, I keep getting caught quite a lot of my, my gaming streets, but no Power Wash Simulator. <laughs> To be fair, my uh, my coffin of Andy and Lele streams got instantly demonetized, like immediately. Yep, the, like, I'm, I'm I doing. Before I streamed uh, them, they were demonetized. I'm doing a little for shits and giggles uh, playthrough of it with Pancake, uh, one of the voice actors I occasionally use, mm -hmm. uh, and all of those get demonetized too immediately. And to be fair, there's some creepy shit in that game. Yeah. 
It's actually a really good game. I'm surprised at how much I'm enjoying it. It's a very good game. That's that's why I'm I'm actually doing the little voice acting series on it. Nobody watches it, and I don't care because I fucking love the game. Like it is unironically the best visual novel. And I, I will call it a visual novel more or less. I've played since Move of Love. It, everyone should everyone should play Coffin of Andy and Lele. It's fucking great. Zero says, the later theory of value, in full effect. Apparently, YouTube does boost you in the algorithms if you don't show up on time. So that's a good thing. Is that actually real? Uh, v says so, so... Uh... <laughs> does V have insider YouTuber knowledge? Probably, he's Romanian. I bet he's gotten in there, uh, into the server room at some point. So I do know some insider YouTuber knowledge myself that I've been taking advantage of. And basically like what you should do once a month is just take down any video that has any, any like any sort of yellow monetization, any sort of copyright strike, any sort of like anything it, it only have pure unblemished videos on your channel. Because if you have that every, every video on your channel gets boosted. And so, like, once a month, I'll put oh, things boy. over on my demonetized channel. I'll purge them off the main channel. And immediately, my entire backlog starts getting recommended to people on their front pages. People are commenting on old videos. Like, d views are going up for everything. It's kind of wild, actually. All right. Well, chat, the channel will be taking a big, fat purging over the next few days. <laughs> Well, see, here, here's the thing, right? So, I mean, you've seen my Devonetized channel before, right? Yep. It's the one that's currently uploading... Um, actually, it's currently uploading all of the Skaven RPs right Heresy's now. Heresy's the question. I'll put it Fire here. Is the answer. So this is a channel <laughs> that is um, under a different email, under a different phone number, uh, run by a different person, different legal name, completely unrelated to me, which is why this works. And all the old videos, that or and any video that has any sort of blemish goes over there, right? So for example, the, the McDonald's video I put a few days ago is already up over there because it had like a copyright strike that I didn't win, right? So it just went over there. And in a month's time, once the McDonald's video is buried in my backlog, I'll just delete it off the main channel. And then like switch around the playlist so that like it's in it's in the order in the playlist, but it's, it's the other channel's version, you know what I mean? So like it's still available if you want to see it, but it's off. And every month, at like the start of the month, I do that, and I get like a massive algorithm boost. Boost, it's great. Right. Well, I guess I'll be moving everything over to Rumble then. <laughs> God, I I hate that because I I don't like Rumble. Heresy's I do not question. like Rumble. Fire Rumble doesn't the have the fucking <laughs> tools it needs. Like, it still doesn't have like fucking basic playlists. Like, God help me, Rumble. What are you doing? Yeah, Rumble and BitChute both. Like, I I liked BitChute a lot back when it first launched, and I still like it. But like, they haven't done any updating to the site at all. Like, it it needs better playlists. It need, like it needs a lot of things. BitChute was the place to be for like alt media at one point. It's kind of declined, I think. Yeah, it's, it's laziness. Like they they're not being alternatives. They're just being, well, no, they're not being competitors. They're just being alternatives. They're just sitting there with their mouths open, waiting for people to get yeeted off YouTube, hoping that it'll come to them, basically. It's a, it's a very, very, very bad way of doing things, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. God, I'm going to have to yeet every yellow video. It's like every stream I've ever made, I think. God help me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, here's the thing. I don't like the idea of any of my content going missing, so I back it all up and I put it on side channels, but... I am keeping the main channel very clean. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I've been, like, hitting gangbuster numbers this past month. It's been kind of crazy. Fire the question. How well I've been doing Fire recently. is the answer. <laughs> right. Well, the purges are coming. Mm -hmm. Zontar says, Dev, you wished Macross were released in America on the monkey paw, didn't you? Those shows going to D plus is your fault. It does not belong on Disney. Wait, is Macross going to D plus? Uh, apparently. Trugs? As on top. Oh, man. 
Art for two years. Russia will probably eventually win. Ukraine after destroying 55% of Russian oil refining capacity in 12 days. Now I'd win. They're still gonna win. They're still gonna win. It's gonna take another two, maybe three, four years. It's an eternal war now. But they're still Actually, gonna win. Yeah. What is your take on the on the you know reenacting that Call of Duty scene where you know a, an airport is shot up in Russia? Oh, that um, I don't think it was the Americans this time around um, because it's too obvious. Like the Americans bombed the Nord Stream pipeline. There's no question about that. But I would like to believe that America wouldn't do this. I I don't think it was the Ukrainians because. How the fuck would this benefit them in any way? Um, I don't think it was the Russians either, because uh, people are speculating so that Putin did this, this yeah. because reasons. It's like, I, I, I don't know. I the think this might... Flag. Yeah, I, I think this just might have been a terrorist attack. Just straight up. I mean, I know that ISIS said they did it. It's like some ISIS cells, like, we did it, we're the guys. ISIS says they've done They do everything. They just... Yeah. Claim credit for everything now. Um, yeah, I think it might just have been a terrorist attack until I see something far more conspicuous. Now, I'm sure that, uh, that Putin will turn around and blame Ukraine. Oh, he already has. Yeah, and use it as an excuse to, uh, to ramp things up. I mean, I... <sighs> Sure, he'll use it an excuse, but I I don't see how he would have really that much benefit from ramping it up. You're already at war, like surely, surely the ramp up's already pretty pretty well underway. I mean, yeah, but maybe this will galvanize public opinion. Uh, I know. Here's the thing: after nine eleven, man, George Bush could and did point the Americans at anyone and anything, and. They, they were ready to march right after 9-11, man. Sure, but I don't know. Like, I think it's going to require a hell of a lot more than this to galvanize Russian opinion after the casualties they've taken. I, I don't know. It seems a weird false flag. I, I, I think it'll probably just be terrorists. Yeah. And we must also remember they did have that whole confrontation with uh, Wagner a while ago as well. And there is a bit of an ongoing like conflict within the Russian army between the uh, the Chechen Muslims and the like um, private militaries who were the only ones who achieved anything in Ukraine. So mm -hmm. maybe some kind of internal political blowout. Yeah. yeah, it's too bad that 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 march on Moscow didn't go anywhere. That that was like interesting for a while. It's like oh shit, something's happening. PSU asks, have you heard about the monk guy who died at 82 or 83 years old and have never seen a woman because he was left at the monastery as a newborn and raised by monks? I haven't, but that sounds like a I blessed have. existence. Here, I'll show, I'll show it to you. Hold on. That sounds like a pretty good way to live your life. Uh, Zeroka, 1444, it's been a member 40 months. You know, for once, if it means they never touch video games again, I fully support their choice to become horse. Okay, I posted the article. The Greek monk who never saw a woman. Wow. He must have lived a fucking amazing life in his preceding life to be given such a blessing. He was an orphan, dropped off on on a mountaintop um, monastery as a baby and just lived there his whole life. And he never once laid eyes on a woman. The world's luckiest man. Fire is the answer. <laughs> Nye nice. Mechworks A Dev 2020 election fraud evidence was rejected on standing because the courts were afraid of fiery but mostly peaceful protests. Oh. Yeah, I don't believe that for a second. I believe they were rejected on standing for reasons of standing, which is what it fucking means. PSU, the game you can stream on 1st of April is My Little Pony, a Maritime Bay Adventure. That's going to cost you a lot more than 50 Norwegian kroners, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Listen, Arch can be convinced to do many things, but everything has a price. And, uh, let's see, Steam. I can't even f find it. My Little Farmies, that does not sound, hmm. 
There we go. A maritime ba oh god, it's no, it's it's not even the the OG stuff. See, I can appreciate the OG stuff for what it is. The new stuff, oh god, no. Surely there is. Surely there's something. Nope, new generation. My god, really? Ah, there we go. Pinball, My Little Pony. There you go. You'll have an easier time convincing me to play Pinball, okay? Anaslope, Shawshank Redemption is better than Green Mile. Uh, Anaslope is, of course, incorrect in this, as we know. Shut up, Steve. Alec Adamson, I'd have thought they'd pick up on the black guy dying first in horror movies, Hope. That would be... I mean, that was kind of the, the premise of Scary Movie. Those parodies, I guess. Hmm. Was it really? I, I mean, the, I mean, it was there was racial it. humor in there was racial humor in Scary Movie, but I don't think that was the point of them. Not the point of it. But anyway, there was an element of it in there at least. Alex, Alexandru, Arch, check out Jagged Alliance Three. It's the best Haiti simulator thus far. P.S. YouTube wouldn't let me send other message. <laughs> I see why. Uh, PSU, how valuable would the Inquisition see a planet if they suddenly found a world that was hidden, that all the people in it was blanks, and every thousand was a pariah? Um, you'd probably never know about it. That's how valuable it would be. And it would be an enormous farm, a breeding farm. Uh, oh, fuck, I've been a member for one month. JT is Can Canada's magical Why negro towards socialism and maid. JT, Justin Trudeau? Justin Trudeau. And my God, Arch, did you see the latest polls? I did not, but he's still going to get reelected. I don't think he is, man. It's too much. Here, just give me a second. Give me a second. Here. Look at this. I'll post it in the link channel. Like, that is utter domination. Liberals projected to have 87 seats, conservatives 201. Like, it's, it's a ridiculous amount of seats that he's going to lose. We'll see. We'll see. There might be fortification afoot. So long as Trudeau escapes with no consequences for abusing his powers, I am still right. And I will still hold that over your head for the rest mm -hmm. of your days. My shamed Boeing CEO says they have an excellent reputation. Actuarial statistics show that flying a 737 MAX is far safer than blowing a whistle. That is true. The the Boeing whistleblower died the other day. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Jesus. Uh, one of those 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 happy accidents that tend to happen to Clintons and Boeing. <laughs> PSU just watched your part three of Power Wash Sim game, and did you know there was a shaved orangutan prostitute in a country in Southeast Asia Paris that was the, the most popular Fire in the area? The answer. Oh. <laughs> Wait, you hadn't heard about that? I didn't. Yeah. So basically, the uh, there was one location that ran out of prostitutes. So they got a orangutan, shaved it, put makeup on it, chained it up in a room, and then taught it basically to twerk. <sighs> hmm. You haven't heard about this? It's like a, it's a, it's a pretty old story at this point. Hmm. <laughs> no. I'm oh, I'm no. trying to find some way to make this make sense or be normal, but no, no. Here you go. Here's the article. <sighs> Heartbreaking story of Pony. God damn it. Of course there's an article. <laughs> yeah. Chained to a wall and lying on a dirty mattress with a full face of makeup, Pony the orangutan waited for her next client. <sighs> well, there you go. A palm oil farm in Borneo. Could per cup, per cup, cup, yeah, English couple of quid to have sex with a prostitute or horrifyingly with her. Right. I, I don't know. I, I think I'd pick the prostitute myself if, if uh, this was a choice I'd be forced to make. Service but, guarantees citizenship. oh well. I guess the question really is, 
what do the other prostitutes look like at that point? Yeah. I want to go back to the PC gaming magazine. Service guarantees citizenship. So on the lich, Dems love the magical melanated person trope. That's why they want to have as many of them as they can in barracks. And magically, poof, you're rich. <laughs> Uh, Mr. X21, Green Mile and Redemption both suck. Hate them both. Wow. That is a level of wrong I have rarely seen. God damn it. <laughs> Reverend Norse, Trump of the Magical Digger is a bullshit as the trope of fridging. Activist ideologies who claim they are tropes but fails up, falls apart in scrutiny. Yes. No, no, these are tropes. I mean, a trope is just something that happens commonly enough to be able to see a pattern. So it's a trope. And also, fridge, fridging was a trope back in the day, too. I mean, for, I don't know if you know this, Arch. Fridging was basically a character comes out as gay and then dies. And that was it. Oh. Sounds like, like justice the, these, to me. These were media tropes back in the day. They're not anymore. The good old days. <laughs> Clearly, they were cliches for a reason. Because they were good. <laughs> Mark James says, Arch, optimism is bad for you. It kind of is, yes. Uh, Doman, Discordia no loves Canty too, Dev. She does. You should tell her. You should send her some pictures of Canty. What's that? Discordia. You should send her pictures of canned tea. Oh, right. Canned iced tea, yeah. Yep. You definitely should. Mr. X31 saw... Ugh, yawn. Ugh. God help me. Ghostbusters, Frozen Kingdom. And while I was in my stadium, 20 scene multiplex, not one of them was showing magical. Not even a poster for the thing. Hmm. It doesn't sound very popular. Giga can't say that word on YouTube. Play Blame Canada every time Dev speaks. Would you please bring back V or Cubes instead, please? Or random guy from street? <laughs> no, Dev is friend-shaped. I mean, if Kibbs or V wants to come back, that's fine. We can all do it together. Mm, don't say it like that, Dev. Why not? Mm, don't. Most next anyone. Speaking of Ghostbusters, 7 out of 10. Not bad. Oh, well, that's high praise these days. And uh, Most next anyone also says Ghostbuster has some flaws, but watchable like Saturday morning. Mm. I mean, I've heard worse. Like is it like the Saturday morning Ghostbusters cartoon then? Maybe. Hope so. Uh, Ziddy Kite, hey, you'll get. You'll got to Why check out Frank answer? Edwards' Yakub, the father of the white devil race. Funniest shit I've read <laughs> in a long time. It does sound like it would be amusing. Uh, Antelope, the Swahili. The Swahili. The Swahili? Oh, uh, African Empires. Swahili. Mr. X21. Mr. Mm. Metica did a better rundown on Yakub. Did he, Dev? Did you fail mm. me? Probably, because I did it on the fly. Oh. Why were you not prepared? <laughs> uh, Zero. I'm surprised that there's no new Shaka Zulu movies. Well... Service guarantees citizens. I, I, I don't know, honestly. Like, Shaka Sulu is a great subject for entertainment, and yet we've had, like, one decent TV series, and that's that's it. He's, he, he just doesn't get covered much. Well, it is because they don't actually want to make movies of black historical figures. They just want to blackwash white historical figures. That does seem to be the case. Um, I would recommend, by the way, the Shaka Zulu television series made in South Africa. Um, I think it's literally just called Shaka or something? Shaka? No, sh no. No, yeah, no, I think it's literally called Shaka, as far as I can tell. Service guarantees citizenship. Possibly, yes. Um, good, good television series. Old, a bit dated, a pinch, but very watchable still to this day. And it's pretty much one of the only ones surrounding him. Uh, Frog Jupiter, did you hear about the illegal being armed? That sounds like a Debian thing. Have you been arming illegal uh, stuff? What are we talking about specifically? Like, what, what illegal? I don't know. About? That's all I said. Did you hear about the, the illegal being armed? 
Nope. No idea what's going on here. Hmm. Uh, Scott the Celt, been a member 14 months. Could the lack of history... Ugh. Why am I yawning all of a sudden? Could the lack of history have been due lack of preservation and not necessarily low literacy? Also, many rivers in Africa are seasonal and hippos. Yeah, the hippos, I think. Well, the lack of history had to do with preservation in large part, and also because there just wasn't that many literate societies. Like, compared to the the total area of Africa, a very small percentage was ruled over by literate empires. And even then, literacy was probably centered around the cities and the upper nobility rather than the peasantry. And there was also, of course, the lack of preservation in that they wrote a lot of this down on stone, clay tablets, and very, very primitive papyrus paper stuff. So that too. As a Jones, hi Arch, The Green Mile is such an incredible movie. The ending when Tom Hanks shakes his hand, then orders the guard to turn the chair on is just devastating and heart wrecking. It is. It's a great movie and everyone should watch it. Of all Spain, we also have the argument that humanity is a lot older than we thought. An extra 200,000 years, so we don't know how many times humanity has rose and fell. Really? An extra 200,000 years? Uh, Mark Shame, Dev, next time you visit the US, go through the southern border with no passport. You get free money, car, squatter rights, gun rights, you assistants get headshot by the ATF. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, probably a good so idea, Dev. You should fly to Mexico first and then get into the US. I don't want to get killed by the cartel. Don't worry, Boog will protect you. <laughs> Uh, Boog says you still haven't tamed the urban chimpanzees. Oh, I don't know what you could possibly be referring to there, Boog. I have no idea. No idea. Listen, Boog would just throw me into the bus and we all know it. I want to deny it, but probably yes. You can't deny it, Arch. His kind are untrustworthy. <laughs> oh, Dev. I was just going to point out that Boog might be untrustworthy, and now you bring it to the whole people. Damn. Way to make it a racial Boog thing. Guaranteed citizenship. Uh, Walter Kvine says, You might be right about the zebras, Dev, but that loser, loser mindset is why Africa have no explanation for why would taming zebras failed. That's true. Like, the, the, the taming zebras are citizenship. not a problem. They're, they're perfectly tameable. They just didn't have the correct mindset. Uh, Mr. Bob 7370, have either of you been paying attention to Haiti? No, so because uh, that seems like a racial war crime in the offing right there. <laughs> yeah, Haiti with the fucking cannibalism. And apparently there's like migrants coming across the ocean to try to land in Florida. <laughs> of course. Yeah, so listen, 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 okay? Chat, real quick, real quick. It it's time for me to rile up the chat for today, Arch, okay? Listen. All the dumb fuck anarchists who are out here going, Dev's a statist, the, go the government's evil, a fucking statist. Listen, Haiti's government is gone. And you know what rules Haiti now? A whole bunch of fucking street gangs that are actually eating each other. Arch, I'm sure you've seen that video of the guy who's like grilling up one of his street gang enemies on a, on a fire and just eating him. I have seen that, yes. Yeah, yeah. So listen, th that's what happens without a state, Okay. I'm not going to sit here and say, and say that all states are amazing. They're clearly not. But anarchy is far fucking worse. But if you do not eat your enemies, how will you absorb their powers? <laughs> like the Highlander or like yeah. Mega Man or something? <laughs> Uh, lucky loser, one and two. Dev, I was the super chat about your Discord last time. It's just not the way to treat your audience, to have them pretend to be happy in a literal second tier Discord channel where they can't post images, etc., and hope that at some point a mod will notice. And grant them the mercy of letting in them in the actual Discord. That just blows. Why would someone do that instead of being in any other server? At least have the guts to call it a Patreon only server. Sucks to be you, pleb. See, I have a 24-hour cooldown uh, room on my ch my server, but so I just let people in after 24 hours. You see, what I do is I'll go down there once a day, and I'll take a look at pe people who are talking, and I'll see, like, people who, who donate get in automatically because the, the bot lets them the in. Question. But I'll go down there Fire once a day, the and answer. I'll see, like, who's talking. <laughs> this guy looks decent. This guy looks decent. I'll just bring him in, you know? 
and that's how it is. People like people say, listen, just call it a Patreon server. Fine, it's a Patreon server. Fuck you. You're not invited. There you go. I'm gatekeeping Paris you. Sees the question. Fire but no, like, like I, I, I do <laughs> hand out passes into the server quite liberally, but it's entirely based on whether or not I think you're an asshole based on how you're chatting down in that room. And also, if you so complain about it, citizen. then I'm definitely not letting you in. Dev quite enjoys playing God. Yes. MW Balls Cracked was awesome for a time. They even had a YouTube with a bunch of fun skits. Then Trump derangement syndrome ruined them. It happens. Much same. Hopefully the GDC follows the footsteps of E3. Did you see the scream at GDC? Oh, I did. They're just screaming for no reason on the lawn. Oh, man. That was that was fun to see. Let's see. Wait, I, I, did you not see it? I'm trying to find it now for so chat. Oh, I thought you were asking me if I had seen it. Hold yes. On. Yes, I have. GDC. Scream. I'm trying to find it for chat. I think there's Service an article guarantees citizenship. There's a picture of them. Oh, no, no. The, 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 the tweet's in the article, yeah. Watch a bunch of game developers screaming in a public park to protest the state of the industry. Yep. That is, that is a thing that actually happened. Uh, let me see. Is the tweet in here? The tweet isn't in here. In mine it is. I post in the link channel. My, this, this is so... Patently cringe chat that you're going to have to. You're going to have to see it. There you go, chat. Prepare your little ears. And there we are. Uh, if anyone thought that the games industry of today didn't need to be purged from uh, top to bottom, then this should certainly convince them. <sighs> it's one of those things where, like, their their industry is collapsing. It's partially their fa fault partially. and partially not. Partially, no. Deb. Partially. It is, it is partially, partially not their fault. But, but here's the thing. It, it is it is just enough not their fault that they're not going to take any responsibility for all the parts in which it is their fault, and that's going to be their scapegoat. I don't know, Deb. I think my mine and your definition of partial responsibility differs. Here's the question. You think Fire so? is the answer. <laughs> I think so. I think these people have picked up the gun, loaded it manually, bullet by bullet, cocked the weapon, put it to their neck, and pulled the trigger repeatedly. <laughs> you think so? I think so. Service guarantees citizenship. I I, th I think these people have laid their they've made their bed like really carefully over many years, and now that the big uh, orangutan by the name of what was it, Pony, has finally entered the room. Oh, Pony the orangutan. I mean, they've definitely done that, but there are some things about the gaming industry that are not their fault. I mean, okay. The, the Fair big, enough. Yeah. We we can we can we can do this. Seventy five percent their fault. Twenty five percent yours. <laughs> so the big one is is the move towards uh, microtransactions. That has nothing to do with wokeness and everything to do with corporations being greedy. I don't know, Dev. I don't know. I think I can find some wokeness in there. <laughs> you think so? Yep. Because the woke need money, because they burn money like a fucking furnace, that's why. <laughs> that's that's kind of tenuous, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I don't know, I consider that to be a pretty fucking steel-clad connection, Dev. <laughs> uh, Boog, so that's how Alicia landed the journo job. Possibly, yes. A very, very desperate Possibly. person at Kotaku. Mm -hmm. Zero, guides aren't for reading, it's for Google ranking, yep. In large parts, and I remember the microtransactions in Mankind Divided. Mankind Divided. Uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Oh. 
Uh, barbarians are us, game journalism, and making stuff up, stuff, English, God help me. Games journalists making stuff up for views? Now I heard it all. Next you tell me that Games Workshop <laughs> is unethical. Yes, that too. So John, the Blackrock or a Vanguard buys Kotaku. I gotta go to the washroom. I'll be back in a second. Yeah, have fun pooping. Dreyfi, it doesn't help that a lot of gaming journalists not only don't seem to like games, but also suck at them. Put that up against an average YouTube reviewer. Absolutely. A bad competitive market. Ranji, I watch your Andy and Lele stuff, Archley. Well, there you go. Now just copy yourself 10,000 times. Question. Fire is the answer. Actually, 20,000 times. And we'll have my average video. Renning Terra. Public service announcement. A couple of months ago, a year ago, Odyssey Library was sued and brought bought by pro ADL people to tackle antisemitism. antisemitism. Do not use it. <laughs> Good to know. But thank you, nevertheless, Ranky, for watching the Andy and Lele one. I, uh, they're, they're a lot of fun to make. I'm sitting there grinning the entire time. Even though it is so obvious I am such a worse voice actor than Pancake. It's not even funny. But at the same time, I'm like, this is funny to me. I enjoy this. This is my hobby now. And I'm going to enforce my hobby upon all of you. I'm going to make it pop up in your fucking sub box. Like, here, you don't care, but you know what? I have fun. Heresy is the question. Fire is the answer. <laughs> Marksman of 117B. In Chechnya, tensions are rising with the Muslims. And then the sun rose. <laughs> Oh, it's a shame that they've thought a three-way war is possible because of Game of Thrones scenario of the three-way wizard duel. Oh, don't worry. Three ways are quite common. Most next anyone, a corrupt judge can reject anything on standing. That is true, but as we know from the state, judges cannot be corrupt. It says so right there in the bylaws. Second Fleet Actual. Hey, Dev. When do I, as an American voter, not having standing when there is an election and issue with voting for my POTUS? Only a totalitarian or an idiot would disagree with my having standing. Yes, Dev. Bad Dev. Reverend Norse, if you're going to start purging, do actually save those streams and videos and rumble. Some of the site. Some of us are still pissed that you have a memory hold all stuff like Mordheim Skaven playthrough. Well, they're supposed to be automatically uploading to Rumble. Um, supposed to. So, I mean, they should be there. Should. Let's see. Oh, God, the fucking... Mm. The back end of that. Why? Okay, yes. Right, so this is the, the Rumble channel, um, which I'm going to have to start linking in the description of videos, I think. And it looks like it's got everything. Uh, sometimes it manages to delete the thumbnail. I don't know why it does that. Sometimes it makes tiny, like, 12-second snippets. I don't know why it does that either. Um, but everything is supposed to be here. The only problem is, like, it's it doesn't have, like, playlists. It doesn't have stuff. And it is really difficult to search anything on it effectively. Like, uh, if I just try it, Rogue Trader 40k, if I try to search that, does it actually give me... S yeah, sort of, but not really. What if I try to search it on the channel is that there there isn't a search option on the channel is there oh god help me oh jesus is there not sweet baby jesus nope there isn't okay well there you go that rumble for you <laughs> uh if i got rumble for you oh god they're so lazy they're so lazy oh rumble you disgusting dog i swear to god Service ah, Rumble just needs to needs to fucking get a grip. That's what they need to do. They just need to get a fucking grip. That is what they need to do. And they just don't seem very interested in doing it. Which is unfortunate for everyone involved. Those 12 second snippets, are they uh are they like clips that people have, have clipped out of streams? No, uh they're just when the stream starts. Rumble makes, like, a separate clip of the beginning of the stream for 12 seconds occasionally for reasons unbeknownst to me. 
Hmm. It is uh, dumb. Certainly sounds like it. Mercenary X21. JT will win because no such thing as a honest election. We will see. We will see. God damn it. Why is there so much election cope? Can't you guys just admit that you fucking lost? Mark the shamed. And no. Canadian Bacon is the movie of Black Dies First. Uh, why Hayden Arch, you still working on big 40k law project? Yes, uh, Sabbath is still in the production. I'm still just wondering around how to actually edit it. Because uh, I actually have several episodes already recorded for it, so eventually. Uh, Zero, would you risk Archcast members on stream? Heavens no. I barely risk dev on stream. <laughs> Wall Spain, no dev. Fridging was the trope of killing a girlfriend wife to give the MC motivation to stop the enemy based on a green lantern finding his girlfriend in a fridge. Oh, that's right. Now there was something different for the for the gay person dying. Yeah. Woman in refrigerators is a literary trope coined by Gail Simone in 1999, describing a trend in fiction in which in, which involves female characters facing disproportionate harm such as death, maiming or assault. To serve as plot devices to motivate male characters, an event known as fridging. Hmm. Um, hold on. Oh, wait. wait, did it come from? Where did it come from? It was Green Lantern. Green Lantern, 1994. The story included a scene in which Green Lantern comes home to find his apartment. To, comes, comes home to his apartment to find that the villain Major Force had killed his girlfriend. And stuffed her into a refrigerator. Damn. Jesus. Well, that's one way to send a fucking message, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. So, John, did you know a California man who ate a severed leg said leg came from a guy hit by a train? So, homeless, homeless guy dies getting hit by a train. Other homeless guy picks up leg, leg and eats it. Okay. When you're hungry, bro. Service guarantees citizenship. Uh, so, John, the main reason we know as much about African history as we do is because of the British rescued it. Now, unironically, yes. Like, hell, it's even the case about Egyptian history. Like, almost everything we know about Egypt or Carthage does not come from Egyptians or Carthaginians. It comes from Greeks and Romans. I recall recently uh, there was some British museum decided to give some some artifacts back to an African country as, as reparations, right? You know, we're going to reverse the colonialism. So they give it back and it goes back to the country and it's immediately sold off for a shit ton of money. Oh, of like, course. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, only we can be trusted with this stuff. We're going to have to keep it. Simple as. Like, I'm sorry if you don't like it, Africa, but it's safer over here. We'll take care of your history for you. Don't worry. Most sexy one. I will take the furry kibs over commie dev because all comics get the free commies get the free helicopter ride to the magical land of their dreams. Furries I can live with. Would you like to become a furry dev? I'm not a commie, sorry. But what about a furry? Oh my god, hold on. There's a website called Women in Refrigerators. Someone's just been compiling on this GeoCities ass website. Someone's just been compiling all of the comic characters who are women who have been hurt to motivate a male character. This is a pretty long list, not gonna not gonna lie. Well, pushing them in fridges sound like a good to me idea to me. You don't want them to spoil. <laughs> Ah, oh, God, see, the, some of the shit they did to superheroes back in the day, though. I like, tortured, murdered, and fertile. I'm like, yep. That's right, they they tore Black Canary's fucking womb out. That was a thing. Yeah. They, uh... But the thing is, too... Question. Fire is the answer. This is also indicative of the opposite, isn't it? This isn't indicative necessarily of the fact that men don't care about women. It's the exact opposite. It is that... An injustice towards a female character has a far greater moral impact 
than an injustice to a male character. Yep. So John says, the main reason we know as much about, I am, Bitch Rescue, uh, Spider Pig 34543, that Shaka Zulu miniseries was great. It was great. I liked it. Reverend Norse, Dev's wrong on tropes and fridging in particular. Dev, you have been owned and exposed. What is your response? Yes. I need to find out what that, uh, I gotta find out what that, the gay version was. I'm surprised you don't know, out of hand. Let me see here. You have veiled your people. Mark ashamed. Illinois judge said undocumented mi migrants carrying guns is constitutionally protected. <laughs> really? Really now? I mean, I sort of, I guess. Meantime, a U.S. airport controller got killed by ATF. Ha. Huh. I mean, you know, the U.S. Uh, extending the right to carry guns to illegal immigrants is... Heresy is the question. Fire is the answer. <laughs> kind of based in a way, I guess. Sort of. Boog protecting Dev depends on his opinions on Dragon B. On Dragon Ball. Okay, Dev, so. Mm -hmm. Your life depends on it. Your your existence as a Colombian, uh, I don't know, victim? Hostage? W <laughs> would there be value in you as a hostage? So... I, I did grow up liking Dragon Ball, yeah. I, did, oh, I didn't yeah. really like Dragon Ball Z after the Cell Saga. The Boo Saga was kind of lame. Didn't really like Dragon Ball GT. But everything from, from the start of Dragon Ball up to the end of the Cell Saga was actually really good. All right, well, I guess we'll see whether or not that's enough for Boo to protect you then. Did you watch Dragon Ball, Arch? No. Really? Why not? Because it doesn't air over here. <laughs> You're missing out, man. It was good. Dragon Ball was awesome. Mark the shame. TikTok squatter writes video how to steal houses. They did change the law around that, but yes, that did happen. A uh, squatter did actually manage to get a house uh, given over to him from the original owner. Uh, Mr. Next one. We already got cannibals in Wasco County. Video of it. See you. Hmm. Is there a video of it? Oh. California, I'm guessing. Boog, no dev. That's what happens with melanin supremacy. Melanin supremacy. Okay, I looked it up. So, I couldn't find the actual term, but there is a TV tropes page called Bury Your Gaze, where the idea is that if you have a, um, if you have a character that's going to go through several life dramas, especially if they're a heroic character, what are they going to do? Well, You've got a coming of age story, right? When they're like younger and they're just starting out as a hero. And then you've got the they get a girlfriend story, they save the girlfriend story, they get married, they have children, and then they heroically sacrifice themselves, right? Like that's that's the the arc Fire of the, the hero. Fire so the answer. what do you do <laughs> like th those are dramatic arcs that most heroes go through, right? Most heroes don't get to live till old age basically. So if you were to have a gay character who's a hero, what arcs would they go through? Heresy is the question. Well, Fire is you can't the make them have kids. <laughs> I mean, they're they're doing it now, but it, it's stupid, right? You can't really make them get married, though that's been normalized now too. Um, you can give them a coming out arc. You know, that could be a source of drama is them trying to come out. Uh, but basically, up until the 2000s, gay characters were viewed heroic gay characters were viewed as less valuable than heroic straight characters because there were certain parts of the heroic narrative they couldn't engage in. So gay characters tended to be pushed along to the, and now they sacrifice themselves or now, and now they die somehow. They, they got to that stage of their, um, of their development significantly earlier than straight characters. And this is probably most, um, most prevalent in, um, in horror movies where like the gay people tend in, in like seventies and eighties slasher films, they tend to be the people who get killed off pretty early on. Um, so, and there's, and the issue is that this was just kind of accepted without really any sort of critical analysis until AIDS came along <laughs> because after the AIDS crisis came along, you actually had a bunch of gays dying early. 
And that's when it started to become a bit more socially taboo to have them die early in your story. So that this actually started getting pushed back against it back in the 90s. Huh. Well, there you go. Uh, Drive He says, Shaka Zulu opening theme song, We Are Growing by Margaret Singana, Singana was a very catchy song. I still listen to it every so often. It was good. I remember that. Uh, Fork Earth says, can we call this Game Gate 2 Planned Parenthood Edition? Why not? Uh, the oh, Sober man. Viking. Okay. Hold on. I, I got I to gotta jump in here regarding, regarding abortion real quick. Okay. Go on. So. Uh, here, I'll, I'll give you guys a bit of a sneak preview. I've been doing a deep dive on um, Cards Against Humanity. So, and one of the things that I discovered is they have a promotion going where if you live in a state that has fully banned abortion, what they'll do is they'll donate all the profits from your order to some activist group that promotes abortion, right? And if you click... I'm pro life on that uh, on the page, and it will actually increase your order by five dollars. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I mean, like that's pretty funny. I can see why people would object to it, but that's actually pretty funny. Like I can laugh at that, but yeah, that's that's one little tidbit. Mm, Dev has a weird sense of humor. Attack Dev. You, you don't think that's funny? No. Oh, you're pro life. You're you're pro life. Let me just increase your your the the price of your order by five dollars so that you must give money to the abortion activists. I think that's fucking hilarious. I would call that illegal, Dev. I would call that a hate crime, Dev. Oh, it's definitely illegal. I don't know definitely. if it's a hate crime, but it's definitely illegal. Oh, but it's I think still somebody funny. should be sued. <laughs> it's still fucking funny. <laughs> I think somebody should lose a lot more money than they've ever donated. Perhaps they should but I'm still going to laugh. The Sober Viking says they are quite literally screaming like babies over not getting their way. They are. They are bad people. Uh, no one, what ha What did happen to V anyway? I missed the squeaker Romanian on these streams. Oh, he was only signed up for, uh, for like a year uh, as a favor, basically, because he is far too busy to be up all night. Especially as Romania is one hour after... Um, me as well, so it would be like one thirty in the morning for him right now. Yep. Basically, he had to choose to do this or D&D. &D, and that yep. was it. Uh, most next one on, you have to manually upload. YouTube is blocking Rumble. Yes. Uh, well, it was actually the other way around. YouTube, uh, Rumble made a, um, a basically a, 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 a how do I put it? Like, a ultimatum where you have to upload to rumble and then they syndicalize to youtube and it's like that's not going to happen rumble you are not more important than youtube i'm sorry <laughs> simple ass you're going to have to put in a lot more work before i start privileging you over youtube i would love to privilege them over youtube that would be great but again they're gonna need to do a lot more work before we arrive at that point Uh, Blade, thanks again for all your great content, Arch. I've been having a lot of long nights after my son's operation, and Beta has been keeping me sane. Well, thank you very much for watching, and I'm happy to help. Uh, Sian Ben, uh, make Arch read all Higurashi Umineko visual novels. Mm, don't wanna. You should, actually. They're good. Uh, weird. In the Eye of Tenor was, if the Eye of Tenor was closed, would the Imperium tech still work? When the rift widened, the machine spirits grow. Uh, would Imperial tech still work? Well, it depends on how real the machine spirit is, I suppose. If it is a warp entity, then no. If it isn't, then yes. And the machine spirit was around even when the Eye of Terror was small during the Horus Heresy, so probably. Uh, Artemis Fowl says, Did I miss Dev simping for Trouts? We didn't actually get to that. Dev was trying to craft drama. He told me about the drama he was trying so desperately to craft, but we never actually did, and it was never brought up. Wait, what drama? Which one this time? There's always, there's so many of them nowadays. Uh, you, simping for Kraut. Oh. Yeah, but he was correct in the end. See, Artemis, I told you. Dev is weird. 
Yeah. Crouch's a good boy, turns out. Boog says, Dev, this is your one and only chance to redeem yourself. Did you start watching Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z? There is only one right answer. I started with Here's Dragon Ball, but I didn't really get into it <laughs> until Z, to be honest. Oh. I think you're going to be left to the cartels, Dev. <laughs> Maybe. I think so. I mean, I did, I did that video on... um. On on uh, Akira Toriyama, people seem to like it. Even though I think I made a few mistakes in it, but people seem to like it. That's the next one. One. I had a hate crime done to me. I am suing for a hundred thousand dollars. Good. <laughs> I hope you win. Yeah. See, I like. I'm very certain that what uh, Cards Against Humanity did with the whole five dollars more if you're pro life thing, like that sounds like it's illegal. It's got to be fucking illegal somehow. But it is funny. I do hope it destroys their company, but it is fucking funny. I do hope it destroys their company. True. And Alex Adams, yes, Higurashi playthrough now. Oh my god, Higurashi's actually really good. It's actually really, really good. We'll, we'll see about that. And I think there's a modern version of it, in fact. Hold on. I think there was. I think I remember hearing something about a remastering you, or something. You, yeah, do you know what you know what this game is, right? Yes, I do know. Okay, so this is not anything new to you then. No, you won't be able to shock me with it, unfortunately. Oh, have you played it before? Or? I watched the anime of it. It was one of the first animes so I watched, and that was an interesting. Really? Uh, oh yeah, my introduction to anime was Higurashi and fucking um, uh, Elfin oh, Lead. God, oh my fucking god, dude! Yep. <laughs> It was a steep hill to climb, but I did it. So here's the thing, right? I mean, I mean can, I, can I find it? Because it was adapted into an anime, yeah. But it was made as, like, uh, I think a late 90s or early 2000s visual novel. Yes. And the original art style is, like, grotesque. Like, look at this. Original art style. The artist is just. The, the artist is known for making just ridiculously huge Paris hands. Is the question. Fire is the answer. Like, like comically <laughs> big hands on all of their characters for some reason. Oh, yes. Like, this was before we knew what drawing was, basically. Yeah. But I think there, there is a recent re-release of it that has, Paris like, more modern art. Fire is the answer. <laughs> and it looks more, more professional. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, here's the re-release. But no, it's a good story. I enjoyed it. It might be a good story, Dev, but... Just but. That's all. But... As if I want to... Whatever happened to that furry purple stateswoman you were commissioning? It was too mean. I decided not to release it. It was too cruel to Dev. What was it? I want to see it now. Nope. Let me see it. No. Nope. Gonna hold it over your head now. No, it's okay. I'm fine. Uh, Spember didn't ask before, but he didn't answer. Favorite food? No need to answer. Dev, we know you'll prefer boot leather and the faint taste of Trudeau's best. <laughs> Listen, my favorite food is sushi. Thank you very much. Oh, that's even worse. A very good sushi is great. Uh, pizza. Pizza, obviously. Pizza. Pizza good. Oh, it's not. To be fair, pizza was my second favorite. Uh, Listen, all right? Before, before I had sushi for the first time, pizza was my favorite. My first year of university... I had pizza every single meal, and I gained about eighty pounds in one year. Because, wow. uh, because basically living in the dormitories, I had meal, I had food provided. It was part of the package, right? So it was a buffet every day, every single day. So I had pizza for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for eight months. That sounds like a pretty good life. I can't lie. I gained 80 pounds in one in one school year, Arch. Yeah, again, sounds like a pretty good life to me. <laughs> Glowy says, you can tame zebras. We have tamed foxes. You just got to selectively breed the aggression out of any... out. If anyone's ever dealt with bulls before, those assholes can be really aggressive. Oh, yeah. Again, why do you arrive in Africa and train zebras to pull their fucking carts in a weekend? They, they could be trained. 
And lucky loser, shit, I forgot to put in the other one, Arch, would you play Battle for Middle-earth on stream? It's really fun with mods, especially with Edain mod. Uh, Battle for Middle-earth, which one is that? Is that the strategy one or the hack and slashy one? Uh, it's the strategy one. Uh, possibly, but that isn't all the video games. That would have to be uh, chat getting autistic and funding it, basically, because I don't think anyone would watch it. Simple as. <laughs> Capitalism Man, prevails. You know what? I'm actually kind of curious. I'm actually kind of curious. Have you, have you ever tried Ogre Battle? Uh, no. It is a Japanese-made strategy game that I actually really enjoyed when I was a kid. It might be up your alley, but it is it is very Japanese, though. It is very Japanese. Okay. <laughs> Basically, it, even though it's a strategy game, you couldn't get Sargon to play it, is what I mean. Hmm. That almost sounds promising. <laughs> Here, let me, um, let, me just, let, me, let me give you a screenshot of this. Like, you have your terrain, and you, you move... Your, it's an old game, obviously. You have your terrain and your character classes, and you move your guys around a map, and you engage in battles, and you have, like, formations and stuff. But it's it's very anime. And Boog confirms that Dev will be left to the Perhaps cartels. Dev did make a mistake. Yes. I corrected him in the comments. Oh, R.I.P. Arnus Fowl. Dev, what was the point of Jeff Holiday and Kraut dropping the names of CRP's IRL associates? Gustavo, in the live stream Perhaps chat, if not question. terrorize their political Fires. enemies into yes. doing what they wanted. <laughs> because Kraut was... Um, looking into CRP's uh, Ponzi scheme, and therefore it had journal. Th there was a journalistic reason to Heresy be looking into the these question. people. Fire is the answer. <laughs> Terror tactics are fine so long as it's in the name of journalism. Dev, twenty twenty four. Listen, every single time I see someone be like, "You must name them," it's like, okay, we should name them. We should name the exploiters. Alex Anderson, but did you watch 2020, 2021, 21 season 3 and 4? 2020, 2021. 2020, 2021. What? I have no idea what that is. I have no idea what that is either. 2021, 21 season 3. No, I have no idea, and Google does not ring any bells. Either. Uh, Zero, did oh. you show Dev my V D and D Photoshop? Yes, I put it in our super secret community chat. Wait, did you hold on? Let me go see. I don't think I see all, saw this. Is it in the D and D chat or is it in our? Which one is it in? Other one, symposium. Okay. Oh, with with V and the five guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, weird. Look at all European maps of Africa. There are three large lakes, maps based on all the maps. I think they found that Atlantis, Atlantis was in the Sahara Desert. Well, there you go. At least we found it, huh? And Doman, Dev Unicorn Overlord is very much like Ogre Battle. Yes, I... I decided to go look up whatever Unicorn Overlord is, and it looks almost identical to Ogre Battle, just more modern. Question. I had a look at Unicorn Overlord, and I was kind of tempted to pick it up, uh, because it has a, you, you can, there's a furry supremacist character, you can mind break <laughs> into liking human dick, and I'm like, okay, you know what, that appeals to me a little bit. <laughs> no, this looks a lot like a more modern ogre battle, so I'm glad that, look, honestly, that, that's happening a lot now, like with, with Stardew Valley and, uh, and Harvest Moon, basically there's these old, these old um, games that aren't being made anymore because the companies aren't making them anymore. And you have indie developers, other developers, who are like, you know what? That was a good game. Why don't we just make one? And that's what's happening now. And it's usually pretty good. But I heard that the translation was apparently really, really bad or something. Yeah, I'm not surprised. That's why I've not been looking at it too much. But... Hmm. Maybe good, maybe not good. Maybe translation is not as bad as it sounds. Maybe it's worse. Then again, I pretty much understand Jap, so... So long as they're speaking, but they're probably not. They're probably writing all the time, aren't they? Fucking scrolling text. Mm. Yep. Uh, sigh. Uh, 
Uh, Artemis Fowl, De there was a journalistic reason to look into him. Has nothing to do with the fact that Can't Jeff and Kraut only use the information to scare the CRP <laughs> and pass it around in DMs. They never attempted to warn the wider public. Can't speak to Jeff, and uh, frankly, I don't like Jeff, and I don't think he likes me that much. I am fairly certain that uh, Kraut basically left the internet before he could make, he, he could actually do the expose. And, and frankly, I don't mind the... Um, I don't mind the whole let's expose somebody who's doing a Ponzi scheme thing because we did that sort of stuff during Gamergate. We we sniffed out people who were doing bad things and we said, here they are. We named and shamed them. And it's happening right now with Sweet Baby Inc. too. I don't mind that shit. Harris sees the question. And I'll let Higurashi season three and four. People thought it was a remake. Uh, three and four. No, I have not watched it. I only watched, I think, the first season because I didn't know what I was watching at that point. Uh, Artemis Fowl again. What was the point of Kraut and Jeff creating Service fake profiles? Citizenship. Scientists hiking in Europe and doxers trying to get alt right people to try and dox them. That only served to normalize the behavior. Um, this is not something I've heard before. So I can't comment on it. Sorry. Mm, Deb's defense falls apart under new information, does it? <laughs> mm. I mean, my knee-jerk reaction to that is that sounds like something Jeff would do. It doesn't sound like something Kraut would do. But I don't know because I, I haven't heard this before. So, sorry. Well, that was the last Super Chat. Maybe this... Oh, God, well, I need to... Before the elections. Right before the elections. That's the Dev <laughs> Artemis stream. <laughs> Gotta hold it out until maximum effect. Maximum impact. Mechanic is on duty. Dev, I approve <laughs> doxes and find hate crimes funny. That's true. Uh, depends, really. Hold on, wait, wait. Hate crimes? Hold the fuck on. Wait. Okay. Yeah. The UK would classify us joking about race as a hate crime, and of course it's funny. So yeah. like, I don't know what exactly you mean there. I know, Dev. You thought Cards Against Humanity was funny when they did a hate crime. You mean against people who uh, who are pro-life? Yep. Yeah, sure. See? Dev is pro-hate crime. Yeah. And we should be yes. very careful around Dev. He's not to be trusted. <laughs> I am pro-hate crime. And Artemis Fowl also says, I want to make sure the audience understands I am the subject matter expert to the crowd saga. Oh, I don't worry, Artemis. I know who you were when you were there. I remember a, everything. It's a fair statement, a fair assertion, in my, opinion, my personal opinion. All but right. no, like, like for, for example, um, I know everyone says that Kraut was the one who, you know, drove, what was her name, Rage After Storm off the internet. That was all question. bullshit. Fire that was entirely answer. all bullshit. <laughs> this will become a sub-debate in the great election debate between Dev and Artemis. <laughs> And Draconis the Violin has been men for six months. There was an African tribe that managed to actually tame water buffalo and would basically point them at their enemies and yell charge. Then Whitey came. Yeah, they, were just, they were just being lazy. They could have done much more, but they were being lazy. You think so? I think so. Unironically, I actually genuinely think so. I think the cold weather theory is fucking 1,000% on the money. Africa, nice, comfortable. You don't have the need to do anything complicated. You head up into Europe, or God help you, Scandinavia? Mmm, no time to laze about. Mm, maybe. Alex Adamson, watch it. Higurashi is one of my favorite things ever. It was pretty fun, but, you know, it's also paralyzing and, you know, traumatizing and all of those things as well, so bear that in mind. It was a terrible thing. But compared to Elfin Lead, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Elfin Lead was worse. Man, Elfin Lead had like what a twelve year old girl getting raped? Oh yeah. And that was only the that was only the beginning. Mm. I mean, the the rape was probably a day off at that point, honestly, considering the experiments they did to them. Holy shit. Yep. And glow in the dark. I want Justin Trudeau to win because it's funny. It would further Hammer home my points against Dev. That is true. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a stream today, Dev? I can't see you. Nope, not today. Hmm. No streaming today this time. Who's currently online? Is Kibbs online? 
Ross mm, is online. Kibbs is enemy of state. Is he? Let's Kibbs see. Enemy of of state. everyone I'm following, following, who's streaming right now? Kibbs is. Mahler is. Tomo and Rosa are. Not many people, to be honest. It's a quiet night tonight. And quiet nights tonight. Yeah. Only enemies of the state. Heresy's the question. Fire right out of his foul. Elf and lead was great. Bando fight was funny. Elf and lead was great. I liked Elf and lead. Man, back when... Okay, back when we were an anime review channel in 2009, we did Elf and lead as an anime review. Like, in, in, you know, in the AVGN style that was common back then. And uh, I don't remember anything about the show anymore. I just remember it was entirely fucked up. It was very fucked up. We did a whole ass video on it. Tremendously so. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, Bando, he, like, he lost his arm. He had, he had, like, a robot arm at one point. And then, like, he had a, a, per, like, a handgun that was big enough to fire rifle rounds. Like, it was specially made for his arm. And then it ended up like bl- like breaking his arm. Do you, do you remember this shit? The question. Fire is the answer. Not that part, no. <laughs> I remember it. I remember that part. Kibbs doesn't like chat mentioning other creators. Got put in timeout without knowing that as a rule. I like Kibbs, but I think he goes a bit too far with that one specific rule sometimes. Like it's a good rule. Like if someone's just constantly talking about somebody else, like I get it. But sometimes he he's a bit he's a bit too heavy handed with that one. Kibbs is a VTuber girl. VTubers never allow you to talk about other people in their chat because girls are easily jealous. Hmm. It's true. I mean, it, there, there's there's like a practical conversation there, right? Where it's like, okay, if you're ch- if you're trying to get your channel off the ground. And everyone is just talking about other channels. And then, like, when someone else goes live, they're like, bye, fuck you, I'm going to go watch someone else. And then everyone leaves. It's like, like that's demoralizing, right? And that, that sh- you shouldn't allow that to happen on your channel because now they're taking away from your show. But I think you can still, like, casually mention someone if something's happening. You know what I mean? Like, it, there's, there's a line you can walk there. And I, I think Kibbs might go a bit too far in the other direction sometimes. Jealous anime girls, Dev. Jealous anime Paris girls. the question. Fire is the answer. <laughs> oh, Artemis Fowler was the, was the anime review era when you worked with the camera lady, Dev. Yes. That is old Long Dev Lore. I remember this. Old I've Dev heard lore. of this. Old Dev Lore. It was common back then. Dev is getting old. Watch out for maid. <laughs> Dev has served his value to society. Dev will now be repurposed. Yeah, probably. When they come for you, Dev, remember to make a video about it first. That way we can benefit from your death. <laughs> All right. With that, we've gone through everything as far as I can see. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for your generous donations. And thank you, Dev. You actually made it to the end for once. Good, Dev. Head pats. No problem. I'm just not streaming tonight. That's why I've, I'm doing something else tonight. So I had a bit more time to hang around. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we will see you all again next week. Have a good night, chat.